Hello, and I'm Jeff from Home Renovation DIY, and welcome to my bathroom. Today's video is going to be a little unique because we have an entire project video here for you for an entire bathroom built from scratch. Now, this is what I call a luxury high-end bathroom. It's kind of middle high, it's not top of the line, but there's really nice fixtures in here and great aesthetic. So, if you're looking at renovating your bathroom and you're not sure what to do and you're looking for great ideas, then come along on the ride, grab yourself a cup of coffee, maybe two, sit back and relax, and we're gonna take you on the journey of all the steps that it takes to build something like this, and any of the information that's missing, because there is a little bit of information missing to help keep this video reasonable, uh, we're gonna put all the links in the video description all broken down so you can go and take a look at specific projects for you later. But in this video, we're gonna just show you the process of what it is to do your own DIY bathroom renovation so you can get an idea, is that something you can tackle? Or maybe you can, there's gonna be elements of this that you wanna source out, but it's gonna be a good time anyway. We'll see you in the video. Oh, and by the way, at the end of the video, we're gonna break down the cost for all of the different elements in this bathroom and different things that you can do because you can make this bathroom here a lot less expensive if you'd like to and get a very similar result. All right, we'll see you at the other side. The secret to installing one of these tower systems is to plan in advance, right? So whenever I'm telling people how to renovate a bathroom and you want custom fixtures, you want something really gorgeous and sexy, the truth is you want to do all your purchases first, have everything on site. Then when you're roughing in and building, you can have reference material other than just a diagram that might be online, which might be outdated, might not be relative to the model number that you're dealing with. So I love to have things, I'm a visual guy, I love to have it and hold it up against a wall and say, this is where I want it to go. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a tower on this wall. Now, this is not a traditional shower system. This is the one that's mounted on top of a finished tile surface. It has your body jets in the hand, the rain shower, the waterfall feature, and it's right here. So let's have a quick look at it. So here we go. Now this is amazing. We just set up a new affiliate program with Wayfair. And the reason I did that is because I found that Amazon's plumbing fixtures were just very limited. There weren't a whole lot of great options. Whereas the Wayfair seems to be more focused on plumbing fixtures and they've got a ton of options, all right? So you can start to see here right out of the gate that this thing is going to be some sexy. But the important thing for me is not what it looks like, it's what's on the back, okay? And this is how they're made. It's kind of like a PEX piping, only it's, it's a lot more like a water supply line as you see for your faucet or your toilet, right? It's a braided faucet line. And what they come with is they come with all the fixtures. And this is a half inch female, very normal thread. And all I have to do is add a half inch male thread to this. And I can connect this water supply line inside the wall. And then I just mount it. Now here's a mounting bracket here. And there's a mounting bracket here. And in the case comes a, a box of hardware. It's like a little French cleat. And I just mount these two little brackets on the wall and I just set it on after I connect the plumbing. It generally is a two person installation, but it's really, really simple. And it gives you the flexibility at a later date to just lift it off the wall, undo your two connections, and then install a new one if you want. Now, on the side, there's gaskets here. This is just so this rests up against the stone. It's a nice clean finish. You don't have to use silicone all over the place. And so it's kind of nice that way, right? What I want to do is I want to hold this up against my wall. I want to identify exactly where I want it to be when it's done so that I can put my marks on the wall and add wood blocking in my frame for where this is going to get mounted because my center line is not where this stud is. So if I want my finish here, which is, to be honest with you, I'm loving that. Oh yeah. I just roll this over and I know that this is going to be here and then this one is there. Boom. Now I don't have to worry about the exact location when I'm finished, but I'm going to add a piece of two by four at this point and down there as well, like an L vertical to this. I'll do mat, 16 inch blocks. 16 inch blocks gives me the ability to raise or lower it when it's time to do the installation, but I know I'm gonna have lumber there to screw it to. One of the other secrets is to remember, because you have water lines coming up the wall, you're gonna to wanna to use a depth of a screw that's not gonna go past the stone and the depth of a two by four. So keep that in mind. 
One of the benefits of doing all the work yourself is when it's time for finishing, you know how you built it so you won't go screw into a water line. <laughs> that would be disastrous. You know, something like this, you'd think it'd be worth a lot of money. But the truth is, it was only $300. And we had it within one week of when we ordered it. Such a deal. We are gonna have a link in the description below of the video so that you can check out our Wayfair link and you can find great deals there too. Very careful when you're doing this. Sink your screw until the wood is pulled tight together. You don't want to leave gaps because that is a weak spot. Most of these shower towers are very similar installation. The locations for the water comes out and where the mounts go, it's going to be unique to each tower. And depending on the person and what features are, you might have a set higher or lower. So by putting in this large block, even though my wood is on the, my mounting plate goes right here, I have flexibility down the road in case I go with a shorter system or the mounting blocks are in different location. I don't want to just attach this through a screw to a plug in the tile. Here's one of those situations where having your product on site is really important. I just went and checked the shower tower to confirm the two water supply lines that are connecting to my lines here, where their location is, where they come out, where they're comfortable. These braided lines, you've got to be careful not to kink them. Now, on the back of that tower, there's actually a little manifold there, okay? And there's a braided line hanging down like this for the hot and the cold. But it's near the bottom, okay? And so what's going to happen is I'm going to actually have it turn up like this and I need my water supply traveling down through the hole towards it. So I'm completely opposite of the way I am right now. So I'm actually going to have to cut the line, put on an elbow, put on an elbow, redirect these water lines coming down so that when I go and attach my water supply I can have a nice comfortable curve and not risk kinking it. Wow, that is really interesting. Almost every one of these towers I put in to date, the water supply was coming straight through the back, okay, and or we were able to put the extra braid line in the wall. In this situation, I have to redirect so I'm, as if my water is coming from the ceiling. Huh, very interesting. Now, if we were doing this in a basement, that's where the water would be coming from, wouldn't be a problem. In this situation, my water is coming from the floor. So, I'm gonna adjust this to there, leave myself a panel open up for installing this later, and I'll do all the plumbing at the point of install. Now that might seem tricky, but the truth is um, I have these water lines disconnected at the other end for now so I can pull them in and out, all right? So I can do all my plumbing, push it back in the wall into position, and then I can bring my water tower in later. <sighs> it pays to plan ahead and to know what your options are and to have your product on site. If this was just about any other job, I would be really in trouble when that tower came because I wouldn't have the flexibility to make these modifications without opening up the wall from the other side. Okay, so we've talked a little briefly about our system here for the shower, how we got a built-in bench. But let's talk about our finishing because this is what I would consider to be a superior waterproofing system, shower installation, than a lot of others. And I know we've got some flack on the channel before because we've used drywall with waterproofing systems. And yes, there are some areas in North America where it's building code that you have to use cement fiberboard. So we thought we'd do this video with the cement board just to demonstrate the differences. And largely the differences are in the, the cutting techniques, to be honest with you. I mean, putting in cement board or drywall or anything else doesn't make a whole lot of difference, but you need the right tools. So, what we're gonna use real quick, we have to switch out our wooden blade. And that's one of the reasons why I love this saw, because everything I need for changing my blades is right here. If I can do it. There we go. I always forget skill saws are backwards, eh? There we go. Now, you can't use a wood blade with carbide tip to cut cement board because it'll almost blind you the amount of dust it creates. <laughs> Let's be honest. I'm switching out a blade that's got 60 tooth for a cement fiber board blade that has six teeth. Now, this blade is not a huge investment. It's less than $20. It's worth picking up. It's available at your local Home Depot. And it just pops on like any other blade. Just make sure your carbide tips our face pointing because the blade rotates counterclockwise, so the blade will be cutting that direction. If you put it on backwards, you'll just sit there and burning a hole in nothing, 
driving yourself crazy wondering why you can't cut the board. The funny thing is it will cut, but it won't go straight. You'll just be all over the place driving yourself crazy. I love my saw. I just push this little button here and I can tighten this back on with the wrench. That nice and easily stores in the handle. Love this saw. Now we can use this. We're only cutting half inch material. So we'll set the blade a little bit shorter so that we're not increasing the amount of heat that we're causing. If you bury the whole blade through the cement board, then all of that blade's making contact as it goes around. It overheats really quickly and then you'll just start veering off track as it goes warped. So, there we go. Put all this back in the case for now. And then we are going to cut the last few boards here that go on this wall. So they're basically two kinds of cement fiber board. Quarter inch and half inch thickness. And you will notice that the quarter inch comes with this grid. And the idea behind this is if you take your utility knife, you can just score and snap. Usually you can just score it and snap it, but not like with your hands. You want to set that edge up on a two by four and then stand on the other piece and it'll break off. And so you can measure and cut that way without the blade. But honestly, I just suggest getting the blade. It gives you a lot more versatility. The half inch doesn't score and snap. You're going to need the blade. And you're going to need that half inch anytime your shower wall is connected to another drywall or surface of the room. Drywall is half an inch, so you want to use half inch cement board here. If you only use the quarter, you've got to attach two layers. And I just think that's bad business. <laughs> These screws that come for this product, there is a blue coating. And they're going to be specially marked for use with cement board. There's also a product out there with green screws as well. Boom. And it installs on the surface. Okay, it's going to be a bump. Don't worry about that. You don't have to go flush because when you're applying your cement for all of your stone, you're going to be using a 3 8 or quarter or half inch cement line anyway. Now, of course, our system for that is to use the fiber tape on all the corners. It's kind of like doing drywall, only after we put the tape on, you want to get some quick set cement and you want to apply with a four inch knife just to set up and seal all the corners before you use a waterproofing membrane. And yes, with cement board, I suggest using a waterproof membrane. This board itself does not get damaged when it gets wet. But if you don't have a waterproof membrane, you're not diverting all the water that gets behind your tile back into your drain. You're still allowing this to soak up the water. And sooner or later, that water will find its way to your frame and it will create a siphon. And that siphon, every time you shower, will put water into the wood. And at one point, that wood will have so much water, it'll start to drip. That's when it's going to come through the ceiling underneath you. The cool thing about these screws is that they're really sharp points. So they get through that cement board like nothing. The difficult part is if you have a bunch in your hand, you're going to poke yourself full of holes. Now you want to install this about the same as you would drywall, okay? One screw every 12 inches. Ow! <laughs> this is where this gets interesting, right? Well, we're just putting on our self-adhesive fiberglass mesh tape. Part of the process for dealing with this cement board, the um, product recommendation is that we use a little bit of quick set over top of that cement. Once it's dry, we can take out our Aqua Defense green membrane. It's the roll-on, and we'll just paint the shower before we tile. Yeah, really handy inside corner trowel. We're putting mesh on these corners. It's not too often you use mesh in a corner. If you're stuck on a drywall job, you can do it. You want to use a quick set cement in those applications. And the same thing here, since we're using a quick set cement, I can use this corner trowel just to embed the tape. And the reason we're using this is to give the cement something to bond to, so it's a continuous bond from one surface to the next. And then, yikes. When it's all said and done, and the cement's dry, then we paint our waterproofing membrane on there. This would be a very, very, very effective way to create a waterproof shower DIY and save a ton of money. There we go. 
Okay. This is actually a great time to ask if you have any questions about waterproofing systems. Just put them in the comment section below because we've used Schluter, we've used regular drywall, we've used a Schluter membrane, the Curdy board, we've used Red Guard, we've used Aqua Defense on drywall, now we're using it on cement board. Every one of these systems is a little bit different, has different pros and cons, including cost and availability. So if you're not sure, you can always ask your questions. Uh, we even did a tile over tile video once, which shows you how to waterproof your existing space and then put a new look inside of the existing one. So, I mean, there's a lot of options out there. And there's no such thing as one right way to do it. There's just a whole lot of different right ways to do it according to what's best for you. <laughs> so here's a question I get all the time. Basically, it's the understanding of how do these assemblies go together. You'll see that this is a shower pan and it has what we call an integrated tile flange, okay? This, this rising piece here is part of the continuous part of the pour of the shower pan and it goes right up against the framework of the space. It's exactly the same as the tub. A tub has an integrated tile flange as well. So whether it's 16 inches high, 20 inches high, or two inches high, they all operate exactly the same. The base gets put up against the framework and then your substrate, whether it's cement or drywall or curdy board or weedy board, whatever you're using, comes and sits on top of this. The secret here is it doesn't matter if it sits directly on top of it. And in most cases, I suggest leave a space because these products have a tendency to flex around when you're walking in them or sitting in them if you're tub. What you do is you just take your mesh tape or your curdy bands, that orange tape that comes with the curdy schluter system, and you tape the gap it almost seems ridiculous when you think about it, but it's so effective. Okay. And then what we're going to do is follow the manufacturer's instructions. We're going to put our quick set cement over top of all of this just to fill it up. It's kind of like doing drywall when we use our, our, um, our 20 minute mix in all of our gaps and cracks before we tape. Similar kind of concept. Here we're going to be filling that gap with cement then we're going to be applying our membrane, which would then get painted from this point all the way up the wall. So there is no way for the water to get in behind any of these substrates or in between any of these cracks once you're finished that way. And that is how you complete your assembly so that you have a complete water diversion system all the way through your shower right to your drain. <laughs> this is my favorite waterproofing membrane, Aqua Defense by MapEye. Uh, it's just a simple roll-on, two coats, you're good to go. Uh, rolls on thick, doesn't run. And the best part about it is one of these tubs will do about four showers. So it's awesome. What we're going to do now is I actually have to run to the store, pick up a bag of quick set cement because I don't have one. I thought I did, but it's been in storage too long and it's gone all clumpy. So I'm going to grab another one. We'll do the quick joints. And then after that's set up in about 20 minutes or so, we'll be able to roll this on. And of course, it's just part of the whole process, right? Get your board on, get it attached, get it taped, get it filled, get it waterproofed, and then it's tile time. But we can do all of that tomorrow. So by the end of tomorrow, we're actually gonna have all of our tile done in here and it'll start to look like a bathroom. I am so excited. So now that our cement board is done, our mesh tape is all installed, we're gonna use our cement compound just to fill in the gaps to create a nice bond from one surface to the next. Uh, we're using Speedset. This is a product I found at a local building store. It sets up in like 15 or 20 minutes, so you gotta work quick. Make it in small batches. Put the water in the pail first, add the mix, give it a quick whip, and then run to job. <laughs> it's gonna be a little nutty, but uh, we'll probably do two or three applications of this, get it all done, and in about a half an hour from now, we'll be able to actually do the waterproofing membrane on the shower. The uh, recommendation from the company that sells the fiberboard is not just put the tape on, but to add the cement. So I'm gonna show you all of the proper procedures today just to make sure that you got the right information. I've got it now where I'm just a little bit thicker than a slurry, which is perfect. Now we gotta run. So the idea is to fill in the gap at the base. This is the most crucial point. And we can always revisit this again after the cement starts to set up. Doesn't have to be pretty right now. Just get it in there. Just one application will do the job. 
and we can clean it all off afterwards. Although the cement, the cement uh, sets pretty quick. There's lots of working time while it's finishing in the hardening process for us to clean it off the shower pan. Of course, make sure you peel back your plastic if you're putting in a new shower pan. Get it out of the way. Because if you waterproof while the plastic's in place, the water will find a way behind it. And that would be disastrous. Okay. So now it's kind of like drywall, right? Bob Ross, the drywall. <laughs> A cement forest. A little tree here yeah, in the mountains. Awesome. All right, now we're gonna work quick here just to get everything. Really the goal is just to get the cement in the fiber so that you have a surface that the water the membrane can bond to. It's starting to get stiff now. This is actually, this is actually the way I like it. I do like it a little stiffer. And this is just kind of like waxing your car. You put it on, then you take it off. You want to try to leave your surface as smooth and flat as possible, so nothing's in the way of the tile installation. If you're working on making a steam shower, the only difference in your application is you want to take your cement board or your waterproof drywall or something, put it on the ceiling and continue all these mesh joints, do the entire ceiling as well. Now generally steam showers, they hold the steam and they have full door systems floor to ceiling. So you really are encapsulating yourself, more like a submarine. In this system, I'm just creating water diversion and protecting myself against a little bit of steam, but not a big deal. In your, when you're in here, the wiring is set, the fan will be on with the lights, and it's guaranteed to evacuate all of the moisture in this room. So, again, to what degree you want to prep yourself for how, what kind of longevity is up to you. But if you use cement board and you seal the joints and you use a waterproofing membrane system, most shower systems with a decent fan in the room, you're looking at a 50 to 75 year shower. Not going to be a worry. And I'm more than happy with that. So we had enough time to get our subfloor down and now that stuff is hard. It's not completely dried out and cured yet, but it does not matter. It is a solid substrate and it's ready to receive our waterproofing system, which is our AquaGuard. Now, I love this product. I've used it before. As a matter of fact, the last bathroom we used this in was in our Mother's Day video, actually. It was the tile over tile video. Ah. And I mentioned in that one before that uh, the tub is a little bit too big for one shower. so. If you keep it handy, you can use it again. And here we are, using the rest of this tub. <laughs> you know, good value. Most houses are two bedroom homes, if you have a, three bedrooms in it. So you're gonna have two showers to renovate over your lifetime. You know, one of them you might wanna redo it completely like this. And the other one you might just wanna give it a bit of a facelift, like a tile over tile job. You should check out that video. We'll put the link in the description. You can see how you can remodel and the difference is versus renovating. Now this stuff is awesome. We're just gonna be cutting in. This is just like painting a wall, right? It's brush and roll. We're bringing our waterproofing system right down to the acrylic base, okay? Before we tile. Here we go. So we're just gonna use this just like we're cutting a wall. Get a nice little coat here. We want to put this on pretty thick. The secret to an effective membrane is actually in the thickness of the material when it's dry. So unlike a wall, where less is more, with waterproofing systems, the more you can leave on, the better. Mapfly is a Canadian company, and it has a pretty big distribution circle. But depending on where you are in this country, North America, or the world, you're gonna have a tile company that'll have a roll-on membrane. This is not a unique product. Been on the market for 20, 30 years. And you can find out whatever distributors you have for tile supply and cements, they'll have this product as well. 
It's very common in commercial applications to use a roll-on membrane when you're tiling. I actually had somebody just the other day mention that uh, they're a guard in the prison system in the UK and they just redid all of the prisoner showers and they just used the roll-on membrane tiled right over top of whatever was there before and that is how they did the job there and they saved a fortune for the taxpayers. I don't think it was on my advice but the point is it's a, it's a good system. It is used by professionals. It is accepted in the industry. So I know there's a lot of guys that like to talk trash about that kind of a product, but at the end of the day, there's a reason these products are on the market. And these kind of roll-on membranes are worth their weight in gold. You don't necessarily have to upgrade to fancy board systems and Weedy and Curdy and Schluter, all these things. I like to say it like this. Based on the investment in the tile and the renovation and the life expectancy of the project, then your substrate systems and your waterproofing systems should be relative to that. So if you're only spending $500 on tile for your bathroom makeover, it doesn't make any sense to spend $1,000 on waterproofing, especially if you're doing it yourself. But if you're spending $1,000 on tile, maybe you're in that market where Looking at protecting that investment for a longer period of time might make some sense. Get it? Rolling? Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So depending on the design of your shower, again, if this is a steam shower, you want to waterproof all of the walls and the ceiling. This is just a regular shower. We're going to have a fan. So really, I could get away with just doing the bottom four feet with the waterproofing system because the cement board it doesn't get damaged if it gets a little bit of moisture in it. Which is why people like to use it and why some states actually have made that part of the building code. But the reality is, if you really want to protect your investment, you want to make sure the water doesn't get to the, the framework behind the cement board, which is why we're using the membrane. It's not the cement board we're worried about. Once it gets wet, it'll transfer that moisture into the wood frame behind it over time. And once the wood starts sucking up that moisture, it'll pull it through the cement, create a siphon, and start dripping on your ceiling. So really what we want to do here is protect the most vulnerable areas from absorbing water. And that is the bottom four feet and around the bench so that when you're done your shower and you're rinsing off your walls and stuff, you're not allowing that water to penetrate and cause an issue. Yep, time for coat number two. <laughs> Between all of us, personally, I think that first coat is gonna be fine. But, <clears throat> this is all about being safe than sorry. Because it only takes one spot for the water to penetrate and cause a whole lot of grief. So, If there's ever a time in construction to have a mindset of doing overkill, the waterproofing membrane is the time to do it. Funny thing is, most of the time when it's time to do overkill, it's the stuff that no one ever sees when you're finished. <laughs> uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm a big believer that people should DIY their own bathroom renovations. Because the most important stuff the plumbing, the waterproofing, all these types of things. These are things that aren't part of the finished project. They're things that if you don't do right, that's where you run into problems. And they're usually the areas where people will cut corners if they're in a hurry. And that's why I think homeowners are their best general contractors out there. Okay, so here's the million dollar question for you. If you've seen some of our other videos, you might have noticed we've done a lot of different types of waterproofing systems. There's no one way to do it. 
Do you like the green stuff? Do you like the red guard? Do you like the Curdy membrane? Do you like the Curdy board? Do you like cement board versus waterproof drywall? A lot of different options out there. I'm curious to hear your opinion. And actually, if you could put in the comment section below, I'd love to know what state or country you live in and what your minimum code is where you live. Because this is one area that is different all over the board. So I chose to waterproof basically at three to four feet, all the way around, including the bench, because I did not have enough material in this bucket to do a whole second shower right to the ceiling. But because this doesn't absorb moisture, and I'm not gonna be standing here spraying water at the wall all day long, I'm not too concerned about it. But where I am concerned about it is if water gets behind the tile and it settles down here, I wanna make sure I divert it back into the shower pan. That's why we're sealing up the bench and around the shower nook area that I'm building and sealing it up right down to the acrylic base. We're not taking any chances. And I know some people might think, oh, you're cutting corners. I think if I waterproofed all of the joints so the water didn't have anywhere to escape, and I left the ability for water behind the tile to get back under the pan, we'll be just fine. Hey, and for the sake of this video, we actually took the tile installation out of this video, but if you really want to see it, it's an 18 by 36. You can click the card link up here, okay? And also, if you want to find something that's maybe a little simpler for you, if you're new to tile, then we'll put a link in the description down below of how to do subway tile, because that would be another great option if you're doing your own shower. Now, let's get back to the video. So now that we're midway through our plumbing, it's time for us to establish our lines. And we've already done the check. We know exactly where the mounting is. We've got our wood in the wall. Now it's time to hook up our plumbing so that it's actually traveling up and then back down to make our connections like we discovered need to be made. What we're gonna use is just a simple little PEX plumbing system. We're going to just do some additions on this with some elbows to redirect the water. Because right now our PEX is facing up and that's not what we want. So for people that aren't familiar with PEX, it's basically a plastic pipe and it has brass fittings and copper rings that get crimped together to create enough pressure around the joint that it will more than withstand anything related to water pressure in the lines. We've seen tests where actually the, the pipe itself will explode before the joints give out. And these pipes are actually designed to expand when it freezes and not break. So you are perfectly safe as long as you're tightening up these things properly. <clears throat> so we're just going to take an inch and a bit of pipe. These are special pipe PEX cutters. And if you need to buy these tools because of your situation, you can hook us up at Amazon. The link's in the description. Check out Jeff's favorite tools. You'll be able to find some really cost-effective PEX plumbing tools for your project. There we go. We just put on these extensions here because now all right, we need to put on two rings and then an elbow. There we go. When working with the stuff, always put on your connectors, your, your copper rings first before you add your fittings. There we are. And then when you put them in position, just give them a pinch and that should help hold it in place. Put these ones on here now. I have always found it easier to make the connection and then cut the pipe to fit. Yep. Great. Okay. Now, can you imagine if I had done the plumbing here on copper? before the unit arrived and I wasn't sure, and I just went off my experience. And in my experience, all of these tower systems, the, the water supply line bends and comes straight out facing the back. So a lot of guys will plumb this up, they'll bring a rigid copper up, put in an elbow with a thread, and it's just mounted there on the wall, ready to roll. And then they come to put the plumbing in, they're like, oh, wow. See, because in the construction site, plumber always comes after the tile when it's finished to mount the unit. He would arrive to this and go, hmm, what to do? Because now his pipe is coming from the bottom. He can't put that extra joint in there because it's not long enough. He's going to cause a crimp. So does the plumber then say, well, let's install it with a crimp. We'll see if we get lucky. Does he add an extra length of one? And then there's not enough room to stuff it all in behind. So then it creates problems there. 
Or does he say, hey, take the tile off the wall, I gotta open the wall and fix the copper? <laughs> At least when you have PEX, you're flexible. You got options. Like I can just basically take this and jam it up in the ceiling. There we go. Now my water line is facing down. How easy is that? So now that I'm installed, right, I just go like this. And here's the best part. I'm going to make this joint. And it's going to be installed outside the wall, lower than the tile. So even if there is a leak, it's inside the shower system. Not going to be a problem. Now these fittings are designed for half inch pecs. And that is a half inch male thread. Standard. Okay. Nothing special here. The unit that comes with the uh, shower tower is a half inch female thread. And these are standard and compatible. There we go. Shower plumbing is now complete. That simple. Just a couple of minutes, all kinds of flexibility. When I go to install this unit, I can go higher or lower just by adjusting this PEX line in the wall. Right? You don't get that kind of flexibility with copper. Okay, well we're finally finished all of our stone. I have yet to get the silicone on, but that's fine. We're going to finish up the tower now. We're going to silicone a little later. We have enough time in the day here to finish filming this video, so this is what we're going to do. Um, the tower, remember, last time we spoke on, we had the uh, extensions for the plumbing done. Let me just reach in here and pull these out. Okay, there's the red line. And now these lines are still very adjustable because I have them running through the basement and they're yet to be connected to the other end. It makes this really easy. If you don't have as flexible of a situation, that's fine. All you need to do is have this out just about an inch or two. But I just find having that flexibility is amazing because these towers are heavy and if you're working alone they're a little difficult to work with. But here we go. Let me go grab the tower and bring it in here. We'll get it all set up. So here's the back of my tower and I've got this connection here. It goes to the, uh, the hose adapter that's going to be attached to this and we'll do that a little later in the video. What we're going to worry about right now is getting the mounts on this wall. You can see there's a mount bracket here and one on the bottom. These mount brackets, originally this hosing, that's your water supply, came down here on the other side of that mount. And if you wanted to, you could have brought the water supply down at the bottom and you could have brought it straight into the wall like this. But then you can see your opportunity there to work is getting really tiny. You'd have to have someone holding it up in the air while you're on your knees crawling around tightening on that. Which is why I opted to bring these free and so that I can run them like this. That's what this height is for. They also have this great little plastic doohickey on here that you can use to tighten those nuts Honestly, when you're in behind that machine setting it up, there's not a lot of space for wrenches. So having that little addition on there really is a game changer. So what we're doing is we're going to visibly put this on the wall. And I'm going to be like, I like that. I like that height. I like this function right on that grout line. Uh, so I'm going to make a mark with my tape. That's where I want that thing. Okay, and then we're going to just measure this sensor. This is just a little digital readout display on the back. And my mount is actually just above it. Wow, that was really handy. All right, so we're gonna measure, first of all, the center of the shower, which is actually right on this line. It's really easy because of my stone that I chose. I know it's at 17 and a half inches, which is great. And I'm going to make my mark for my first bracket at that height. Now all I do is measure off the distance bracket to bracket and I can translate that information. There we go. This way you want to get pretty much exact. Okay. 37 and a quarter. All right. Now I should be able to guess within three feet here. <laughs> 37 and a quarter from that location. There's my center line. Okay, just to be sure, I'm going to grab my laser level, throw a line on that, make sure I got it perfect. Wow, that's actually dead on. Brilliant. Here we are, we have our hardware. This is my shower wand and hose and connections. We'll put all that on the tower in a minute. But in the bag also comes with what I call my little French cleat mounting clips. Okay, so the idea 
as you mount it on there, this gets screwed to the wall, and then the, the bar on the back of the unit will come down and slide over behind it, causing it to be compressed to the wall. Nice and simple. It also comes with the plugs that I need, which are quarter inch number eight screw plugs, stainless steel screws, and this is my favorite. Got some plastic washers in there. If you're working with a textured stone, you want to install one of these shower units, you might need to use one of these in order to create enough clearance to get that unit to clip on, okay? So textured stone, sometimes you'll have to put this in behind the plate to build the plate off the wall so that your unit can still mount on top of that in the midst of all of that texture. That's there as well, that's a nice option. So here we go. So because we have our, our center mark, cross line we're going to put this up here and we're going to use our little tiny torpedo level which over small area is incredibly exact if you get it exactly on the line in that bubble there we go that's my installation line bam okay and we'll just confirm that there's 37 and a quarter that was the number we were using All right. loving it the reason you want that perfect is there's only this little bit of area here to work with. This slope is actually what pulls the machine under gravity towards the wall. If you have them set too far apart, it'll engage with one piece and not the other, and the machine will end up wobbling around, and that's not desirable. So, now we take our clips, because the back of that machine that we were measuring from actually sits right near the bottom, all right? So your overall dimension of where we roughed it in it's gonna be plus or minus half an inch, so don't be too hard on yourself here. Let's just work with the numbers that we got. And I'm just gonna mark a center line on the actual bracket so I can line it up on my pencil as well. And I'm gonna over exaggerate where those holes are so I know exactly where to drill. This will keep everything looking relatively perfect every time. Okay, we have a beautiful quarter inch glass and tile bit. Nothing fancy, it's pretty simple. We're just going to go low speed on the drill, and this should grind through that tile just with ease. You hear this? That's the grinding sound of the blade, okay? All right. I'm going to get all four started before I wear off my tip a little bit. And then I'm going to show you a trick to show you how to keep the drill bit from getting overheated. Because they will split if they get too hot. Now that we have our hole started, we don't need the tape anymore. I'm just going to get our wet sponge. We were using this for grouting earlier. I'm going to put my drill bit in my tip. And I'm just going to drill while I keep it wet. Two things. That tip works great on ceramic. And you'll find that your blade will last a lot longer. It also takes forever to drill the hole. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. This is how I like to get through the mistone, because I don't have all day. And I just wet the bit. There you go. Now, I've had people telling me for years, don't use it on hammer drill, but look how fast that was. I mean, why would you not? Oh, that's two down. I'd still be working on that first hole if I was using the other system. Yeah, I know the bits don't last as long, but how often are you gonna install a shower? You can afford the seven bucks. You don't wanna be here all day messing around with making a couple of holes. If you remember, we put wood in behind these areas so we don't have to rely on the plugs, which is what we did. We just went right through the cement to the wood. Now we can screw right to the wood. That's awesome. <sighs> Probably gonna be a Phillips head. God. <sighs> the bane of my existence. 
Okay, so it's easier to put the screw, when they're Phillips especially, into your hardware. Oh, typical. Screws aren't long enough to go from my tile through my cement board into the wood. Uh huh. I gotta rely on the plugs now. That's just great. Or I go get a longer screw. Problem solved. I grab some two and a half inch deck screws. Because if you remember, you don't want to go with more screw than you need. We have one and a half inch, think two by fours in behind on the flat, plus a half inch cement board, plus almost half inch for tile. That's two and a half. This will not put my plumbing at risk because the head of that screw is not going to go past the plate and the thickness of that plate plus the head is almost a quarter. So we're in great shape. Now it's just a matter of drilling that in. All right. Again, be careful you don't over tighten. Make sure your cement is nice and dry in behind. We want it stiff, but not too tight. Just until this thing stops wiggling. So here's the elbow that leads to the hand wand. This always drives me crazy. Look at this. There's a filter on the intake. I hate restrictions on my water flow. It has nothing to do with nothing. Oh yeah, baby. Now we're gonna get some pressure. Hey, that's a decent quality hose. Ha, surprise, surprise. When the hose goes like this, that means it's a nice metal hose. If it's all kinked up out of the package, it means it's half plastic. For 50 bucks, you can get a really nice metal one. Here's my only problem. Oh, no, those are, that's a siliconized rubber gasket. These hoses come with built-in gaskets. Very nice. Okay, so those are my three components, right? And this looks like this is my clamp for attaching to my tower. All right, now, just a quick word of warning. On the back of this tower, almost every unit I've ever had has a little gasket on it, okay? It's covering the galvanized edge, all right? So when you're grabbing your tower, by the, you're nice and safe. All the rest of this area, and like when you're having a shower, don't reach up. This is sheet metal. It's just raw cut. When your hands are wet, if you touch this, it'll slice you to the bone. So be careful. There's no such thing as a company that doesn't have exposed metal on it. So be smart when you're installing. Make sure you're grabbing the gasket on the back. Okay, here we go. There are two things at play here. One is we want to attach this to the outside. Right. You see that it's cut a little bit oval? So is the threaded connection. All right, so you can't confuse that. Put that in, leave that gasket there. It's to keep the water from coming in. If you want a really better, if you want a better look, we could put the gasket on the inside. To be honest with you, if a little water gets in, it's not the end of the world. I'm going like this, because I like sexy. All of these are plastic parts. Okay, so. The danger here is of over tightening and breaking it. What I like to do is I like to rotate this about five degrees past my level, as tight as I can, and then rotate this back into position. This is where having a good adjustable crescent wrench handy is really nice. Now remember, if this comes up coming a little loose over time, which it's quite possible because of the, the type of materials we're working with here. Everything here is a plastic fitting. So having it loose is not gonna be a big surprise. It's not a problem, you lift it off the wall. Once we install it, it can be just lifted off, have someone work with you, or you can use my cheat when you're taking it off to set it down, and you can tighten up all your plumbing connections. Now, here we are. This is the supply line that goes to that wand. Okay, use my trick, roll backwards, Right there, you, you hear that? And then you go forward. That way you know you're not cross-threading. Whenever you're threading a plastic fitting on a plastic fitting, don't discount your own strength. You can easily cross-thread that and just reef it on and think you're nice and tight and what you've done is destroyed your seal. Get this nice and snug, moderate strength here, you know, okay? And don't overdo it. And then pull the hose into position. That should move freely. We're in good shape. Okay. This hose here has two ends. 
This end is the one that sits in the cradle. Just confirm that before you go and install it, okay? Because the threading is universal and it will work on both ends. Oop. <laughs> like I was saying, go backwards. Boy, I can't even tell you all the times I've wrecked something in my life until I learned that secret. It drives you crazy. At this point, I wanna have a shower tomorrow morning in here. <laughs> I don't wanna be wondering if I can have a shower. All right, wrap your bubble wrap on your fitting. And tighten it up with the pliers again. Okay, you can tighten it too much and it'll break. It'll break. If you don't tighten it enough, it'll drip, but you're inside a shower. <laughs> okay, so if you're gonna make a mistake, err on the side of needing to tighten it some more later, because that's always an option. Replacing the part, that'll just wreck your day. Okay, so now we're ready to install this bad boy. We needed a creative table here, something with some weight. So the pail of water from when I grouted, I'll throw my hawk on there. It's made of solid aluminum, so nothing bad's gonna happen there. We're just gonna lift this tower up in the air and set it there. Now I can connect. Now realize, these lines are color-coded for hot and cold, just like my water supply lines. So this should be about as simple as it ever gets. This is metal on metal, so the risk of cross-threading is not the same. If it goes two turns around, you're fine. Use this little wrench for some leverage. Okay, here we go. This line. I mean, I've seen situations where there'll be two or three guys working together trying to mount one of these things. It's just like, just take two seconds. Think about a platform you can rest your fixture on. Get on with your life. Now, we've got them hand tight. Now the fitting has the ability to put a wrench on it. Let's take advantage of it. <clears throat> okay? Because this thing's going inside the wall, right? This is not a place where you want to fool around. <clears throat> All right. There we go. That's it. Now. Now for my next act. Okay. We're going to lift these back up in the wall. Now we don't have to have this plumbing actually in the wall. Lots of room in the cavity here for it. So let's not be afraid to take advantage of that space. And we're hanging high. We're in a good position now. Press against the wall with your knee and your hands and slide down to engage the mechanism. That's it. Now it's a little dusty, but you'll see on the side here, that gasket is engaged almost completely, which is really nice. Okay, now these systems, you'll see, There, now it's snug on. Now it's not pulling off the same. There we go. Now, inevitably people are gonna ask me, what about the big hole in the wall, Jeff? Here's the secret. If you have your fan on when you're in the shower, all the moisture that goes into the air is being pulled out of the air at 110 cubic feet per minute. You're not gonna have this wall start sweating on you and dripping in behind. If you get a little bit of moisture behind that wall, you are made with tile and cement board okay, which will not mold. If the water actually drips in the wall cavity, the house is made of wood, it can absorb a couple ounces of water every month, <laughs> every day. <laughs> it can absorb a lot of water and redistribute it back into the atmosphere. Relative humidity takes care of all these issues. Don't get hung up on the details. This is a fabulous system. And for God's sake, don't pull out the clear silicone and start getting that goop all over the side of your, just to think that you're waterproofing it. That's a waste of time. It looks ugly and it'll end up coming loose because this is a wet area and silicone that sits in that much water with something that's moving, it's gonna break loose of the seal. You're gonna not have clear anymore. It'll look translucent, white, nasty. Leave it pretty, leave it like it is, all right? And enjoy it. And if it ever starts causing you problems, take the 20 minutes, half an hour to replace it with another system. What a great idea, especially when you go to sell your house. So five, 10 years from now, when I wanna sell this place, I can take this, Put another $300 unit on, have a brand new shower. Because the stone doesn't age. But generally speaking, 
metals lose their polish over time. And that would be nice to update. So in this video, we're going to be installing this Live Edge countertop in our bathroom. And we're going to mount it floating off the wall. We're going to show you all the steps necessary for mounting it and preparing the countertop. Maddie, if you can take that out of the way for me. Thanks, buddy. I'm going to start sanding right now. What we're going to do, we're just going to take our three quarter inch rod. It comes with elbows that you can buy at the hardware store. This is standard stuff at any Home Depot, so you don't have to hunt around for it. And you can buy the elbow and the rod, and both ends of the rod are threaded which means if you buy a four foot rod like this, you can cut it and have the extension coming out as well. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to set this up. I'm gonna have Matt cut right there. I think I like that, that height there. So we basically wanted our countertop set to about 32 inches. We're gonna use a vessel sink so we don't wanna to be too high. And that's right around here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna eyeball my mark, give myself a little bit of room and here we go. Now, Matt, what I want you to do is give me three of these pieces, cut at the same spot here, okay? But I need three pieces at 18 inches, okay? So three of this length and then three at 18 inches, okay? And there's two more rods right over there. You can cut those off for me. Now, Matt's gonna be using that Evolution saw. It's our new tool. One blade cuts wood and metal. If you haven't seen it per function before, we have a video where we did a huge hardwood deck. Unbelievable. We did the whole deck out of hardwood for three days cutting on that blade, and then it was still able to cut through quarter inch tube steel. <laughs> Blew my mind. We're still using that same blade today. And uh, if you want to check that out, we'll put a link in the description of that video. It was awesome. Need the thread, yeah. <laughs> That's very important. That's why I want to get all the marks on before you start cutting. All right, I'll take the tape and mark. I'll mark these two up as well. There we go. Thumb up against the fence. Here, you got. You're creating a pivot. Thank you. It's the same thing. No, it's not. Yes, Dad. So now that we have our pieces cut, we've assembled them, you just thread it into the corner like that. And you can start to realize real quick in a hurry how this is gonna to come together. Now, these elbows don't necessarily make the pipe square. The goal is to set this up where this is perfectly level and all at the same height. So in order to do that, you're going on a nice piece of straight lumber and a laser level. That way we can set the back and the front dead level and then mount it all Accordingly, now my laser level has a universal thread on it for all camera stands, which makes this awesome Because I can adjust the height of this bad boy exactly where I want it Okay Done so I'm using my laser line to tell me where the level is for the top of the pipe and that'll be the, where the thickness of the countertop starts Okay, and so there you go, plus a vessel sink that makes that very comfortable. And now we're just gonna take our piece of two by six stock here, and we're gonna set this up on right at the line and put in the mounting screw right where we want it. Okay. There we go. So now I have a positive stop. So when I'm installing my rod, the back of the counter will all be level, right? And what we can do is we can manipulate the angle that we install this to get the front level. Okay. So now, I'm gonna drop my laser level about three eighths of an inch. There we go. And my goal will have all of these lines on the pipes in the same spot. 
Now, I got a laser line right down the middle of my pipe, and I know that that's going to be level. So I just keep changing my line here. Oh, well, that's going to work out awesome. So these clips, they actually snap on exactly the dimension of the same pipe. And you put it right underneath the elbow, okay? And then the best way I can figure to do this is going to be get my pipe perfectly level first. And then when it's in a perfect position, take my marker and mark my points where I want my screws to go. Okay, so we're just going to use our torpedo level here as well. When you're working with a counter, if you install your brackets with about a one or two degree angle up, that's fine, because there's a little bit of flex in here under the weight. And under, under, when I pull on this, under the weight, it's going to be level. That is awesome. So we do this three times. We've got the same setup. And what I can do is I can actually pull out my four foot level, and after I get all these rods installed on one or two screws, I can put the level across the front of the steel as well, just make any minor adjustments. Huh, this is awesome. Okay, let me have the other two, buddy. Two, two, two. Perfect every time. The funniest thing about this whole system is that when you go to the, uh, the wood store to buy your wood, the big slab, because it's made of pine, it was only 160 bucks. Right, that's for a 20 inch deep by almost seven feet. That's a great deal. And then right next to it, they're selling square steel tubing, which of course you'd have to paint and prime and put together. They sell the leg assembly for you. It's ridiculously expensive. It costs as much as the wood. This galvanized pipe, this four foot, um, it was $9 and the elbow was another two. So for 35 bucks, I got all the hardware for this counter. And the only thing you need to do is be able to cut that steel down. Now you can use a grinder or a hacksaw if you had to. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. I'm spoiled rotten because I've got that new evolution saw, but if you don't, the only reason they charge so much money for that steel leg is because people don't have any idea how to fashion a proper way to attach the wood. So having a system like this in place is great for counters. Mm. Liking it. Perfect. But if you wanted to uh, just buy some square steel, you'd be surprised how cheap it is. And if you have the ability to cut it, you can save yourself a fortune. So just so you can visualize this, I'm going to have a live edge solid wood countertop, almost seven feet across the room. We're going to mount a couple of undermount basket shelving. This is going to look really nice. It leaves a huge open concept. You get that illusion of space. You get that easy to keep clean and it replaces the need for an entire vanity. Now, a live edge counter plus a, a top mount vessel sink and a faucet. I mean, the vanity for me is going to be less than $200. Try to find a vanity for $200. Good luck. This is the way to go. Sometimes when you go minimalist, you can save a fortune. We're done with this now, right? Okay. So now all we have to do is untwist these out of the out of the threads, set them aside, install our drywall, and we're just going to measure from the edge here. Make a mark with our pencil, so we can roto zip out a hole. And then after the drywall is installed and everything's finished, we can come back and slide these rods back in. We're ready to mount our countertop. We can use the same clips underneath to attach the countertop to the rod. Nice and simple. So that's the uh, preparation phase. Now let's go take a look at all the steps that are necessary to get the countertop ready to go. So I got my laser level set up. This will be my center line, okay? And you can see it way out here, okay? So what you want to do is you want to take a look at your measurement. We're going with a 20 inch deep counter. What you want to do is just mark your, make a mark on your wall. So you're going to just make a pencil mark at 20 inch on the laser line. Got one on each side, okay? We're going to mark on the drywall, the back measurement and the front measurement off the center line. Okay, so left to right, left side on the back, it's 35 and three quarters, okay? 
and on the right side on the back, it is going to be 32 and 3 quarters. Okay, now do the same thing here. And this is where the trick is. You come over here and you get your number here. So 35, and always go just a hair smaller. It's safer that way, 35 and an eighth. Okay, that's significantly different, isn't it? Mm. But check this out. And there's no such thing as a square wall, mm. right? <laughs> so you can't, when you're cutting something that's already not square, doesn't have a straight edge, you gotta go from a center line. So you're gonna template the cut on this wall and then translate all this information onto your wood slab. Now, the front over here, do the same thing. There's a number there, 33 and a, we'll call it an eighth. Okay. Now, you take this information, so you take your slab, okay, and you're going to drop your center line on it, right? Mm -hmm. And then what we're going to do is, although the slab is shaped like this, we're going to cut from this corner, something as square as we can here. And then we're going to take the center line and translate all these pieces of information onto it. And we'll cut both ends to fit the room. Make sense? All right? Beautiful. All right. It's all you. All right. We can always buy another one if you mess it up, but I'd rather not. So let's measure twice and we'll cut once. <laughs> so basically what we're doing is we're taking this center line and we're measuring from this point to the wall. On the back side, which is what that stands for, on the left and the right, and on the front side, left, bam, and the right side. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our slab, throw a center line on it, and then measure all four of those intersections so we can cut those lines, and then we can go straight across the back and clean it up. We're just gonna drop that sucker right in there when we're done, and it'll be perfect. So we've got the counter on our bench. It's upside down, because the skill saw cuts from the bottom clean. And I've set the, my straight edge on the back side that I'm going to cut that represents where the wall goes. The live edge is on an angle, so I'm going to take off about an inch and a half. Now, this is not exact science. I don't need a track saw for this, and I'll tell you why. Because my wall is not straight. And I'm going to end up, at the end of the day, once I get this cut to fit, when the room is all finished, I'm ready to install it. Then I'm going to take this countertop in there, set it on my rods, and then I'm going to scribe the back wall so it fits perfectly. But that's after everything else is done. For now, what we want to do is create a straight line and start the fabrication process so that I can measure from my center line and duplicate my dimension of my room and cut the sides as well. There's no sense refinishing the entire slab. We only want to spend time sanding and finishing the part we're going to use. Here we go. All right. Now, what we want to do is take a measurement of the whole thing. It was 78 inches. That makes the center line around 39. Okay. So now all I got to do is translate this number, my center line, sorry, so I can translate the numbers. Now we're relatively straight here now. So I get the opportunity. There we go. That represents my center line. This is where it gets tricky. <laughs> One of the secrets about working upside down is knowing the difference between left and right now. So when this is installed, I'm flipping it over, okay? This is my left side, this is my right side. So my left side on the front is 35 and an eighth from here, because that's the front. Because it's a little backwards. So I'm gonna measure off 35 and an eighth. On the back, the, the front story, and on the back side, it is 35 and three quarters. And we're just going to translate this information that we took off the other room. Then we can connect the dots, and that'll be our cut line. There we go. And so before we go to refinish, we're going to take this in the other room, and we'll actually set it into the space just to make sure. 33 and an eighth. Yeah, these balls are really, really out. 
Okay, get an idea. That's square. Wow. Yep, I live in a parallelogram. <laughs> One more time real quick. We'll just confirm this. That's my back. That's the front. This is still the left side. 35 and an eighth. Yes. This is the left front side, back side, 35 and three quarters. Got it. Now we'll cut the ends off. Now I'm going to cut at the line, but I'm going to cut on the line. Basically giving myself about a sixteenth of an inch extra material. It's easier for me to make sure it's all fit snug and good. If it's a little tight, it's easier to shave it off. It's hard to make the countertop grow. So <laughs> we're going to leave ourselves a little bit of mercy. I'm going to take the guard off here. So I'll go low, and you go high, we'll square it out. Now you can see the countertop's intentionally a little bit larger than it needs to be. There's two factors here that we have to take into effect. One, we haven't done any drywall mud work yet, so those corners are going to build out. And two, this part of the wallet has a bit of a bow, and so this wasn't cut enough. And you just draw it out. There's our new cut line. That'll make this perfect. And then I'm going to set Matt to work sanding this surface down and making it perfect, okay? Ha! Huh. Okay, so now we've got our scribe cut done. Relatively speaking, it's the perfect size for the hole. Now, no matter what you do at this point, you're going to need to do some fine-tuning with the cutting later. Proper scribing you should do after all your drywall mud is done, sanded, primed, painted. But in the meantime, we are going to go ahead and finish the countertop because this is a lot of labor. So we're just going to use a basic orbital sander and 80 grit sandpaper. Get rid of all of these uh, factory dents and nicks and scratches. Okay, anything that's uh, left over from the saw. And then after we're done with this, we'll whip over to 180 grit sandpaper, give it a nice smooth finish. And then we'll put on the finish and we'll show you that finish later. We're using a water-based flat finish and we're going to fill up all of the, the bark as well. As do with three coats on this. Oh, this is gonna look amazing. I should mention, make sure we're in a good quality mask. I recommend these, you'll see them on our Amazon page, and collect all of your dust in a container like this. What you can do is at the end of this, we're going to mix this with some glue, and we'll actually make a paste we can use to fill all these holes before we switch over to the last sandpaper. And that way we'll have a nice finished filled countertop with no divots. It'll be a lot easier. <laughs> So I've cut my drywall, the dimension of the space. And now what I have to do is I have to translate all this information. So the best way to do it is just to measure down, get nice and low. This is nine and a quarter by nine. Okay. And so the top number will be the, the, the distance from the left. The bottom number will be the distance down from the edge of the drywall. And so they should all be about the same. Now we take all that information, translate it onto our sheet of drywall, and this is cute. My wife surprised me today. Mm -hmm. My last sheet of drywall and she leaves me a love note. Isn't that cute? <laughs> I told her, I said, you had to use black marker, now I've got to use special primer just to cover that up. <laughs> oh well. All right, down nine and a quarter. There we go, and we just put a cross. And 25 and a quarter. I'm also going to draw the relative size of the hole that I need. So this is a three quarter inch hole. 
This is a three quarter inch hole. I'm cutting bigger than I need because I'm going to be using uh, cover extensions to cover it all up. This is an inch and a half pipe, so three quarters and like that. These are just half inch water lines. And now I'm going to go get my rotor zip and we're ripping all these holes in. Now you can always use a drywall saw to cut a hole like this. You just got to force it in, jiggle that sucker around. It can be a real frustration. Or you can check out a list of my favorite tools. Grab one of these for a couple hundred bucks and you can cut drywall like nobody's business. Be as creative as you want. Now all we gotta do is line this up. <laughs> okay. So drywall is a de relatively dense material, but if you put a hammer to it, you're just gonna cause damage right at the point of impact. But if you use a piece of wood to distribute the impact, you get all that force into a larger area and you won't damage your drywall. So in this situation, I just need a little bit of love to put it down. And one more. Done. Same thing. You don't want to wreck your drywall. Okay. Then we can lift this into position. <clears throat> Maybe not. Now, <laughs> there's a fine line between giving something a little love with a hammer and just trying to be way too aggressive. Like, I'm trying to lift this drywall up. I got to close three eighths of an inch. I'm pressed tight in here. So if I don't cut some of this out, I'm guaranteed to destroy my wall. Okay. Now when I go there, I can step on it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That is something that I'm gonna be able to live with a lot easier. Take a little bit more here. Yeah, beautiful. I'll just show you now we got that hung up in there here's your countertop now go backwards until you, oh, until you feel it seated, sit in the thread and there's your countertop okay there we go now this area around here real easy to fill up when we pull out the drywall mud I'll just use a little bit of quick suck compound pop maybe just a little bit of mesh we'll clean it up naturally there is no natural flange cover that goes over these that's attractive, so we're just going to try to create a nice clean paint edge the best we can. Move this out of the way for now so we don't get an accident. Michelle loves Jeff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a corny brat, eh? Okay, so we're done our first level of sanding here, and you'll see there's some pitted areas where we've got knots and that sort of thing. Real quick, if I just take my sawdust and rub it in, Right? You get an idea of what it'll look like when it's all finished. But that's just dust. There's nothing there to keep it there. <coughs> and it just pits again. So here's what we do. We are going to take a little bit of wood glue. And we're going to take off the filter. There we go. That's plenty. And we're just going to make a little paste. <laughs> now, the wood glue on its own, it has its own coloration. But if you use the same dust material and mix it in with your glue, and then use that as your patching compound, you'll have something that'll fill the hole and be relatively the same color. It'll look a lot nicer. Now, the reason I like to use the sawdust is it adds a little bit more of a filler to this material so that when the glue dries it doesn't shrink quite so much. We've got another big hole back here to fill too, so... Now this is not a technique, it's not like working with epoxy, alright? The whole point of this is to fill the hole 
so that when we add our finish, we don't have to go five, six, seven layers of finish to fill these holes. All right. We're just making sure that every aspect of this wood that isn't perfect is sandable. So we have a flat finish and then two or three coats of finish will do the job. Yep, that needs a little bit more too. There we go. Okay. And this is Woodworking 101. It's not the sexiest video on how to fill a hole, but it sure as heck works. We'll go back with the 80 grit sandpaper in about 20 minutes. We'll give it a quick once over, just to get all the glue residue off of the surface of the wood. And then we'll finish up one more time with the 220 grit sandpaper to finish it all off. <sighs> and then we can start the finishing process. So here we are. We've actually done the second coat off camera. We're gonna bring you up to speed though. What we did is we just took our orbital sander, 220 paper, and we just did a quick pass over the entire first coat, and then we wiped it down with a rag and wet water just to get rid of all of the dirt. Because generally speaking, we were working in the dirty area. Now we've we cleaned up the area, and now we're ready for our third coat. It's nice and smooth. We don't wanna use the orbital sander again because we have a nice clean surface. But what we do wanna do, is go heavy on this coat. The first coat, and usually most of the second, generally speaking, is just to seal the wood, especially with softwood lumber. So now we're gonna go really heavy on this product, and we're gonna start from the middle and drag to the outside, because outside is where the dirt is hiding. And so what we're gonna do is just go really heavy on this coat. Here we go. Now this is a water-based product. I've never used it before, but it's from the same place where we bought the wood and they recommended it. So I'll always take a recommendation from a store that is a specialty store and use their products. It's a great way to expand your knowledge base. It's also a great idea since they're using that product on their wood on a regular basis to have some kind of a expectation of a good result, right? Now, just to give you an idea, when you go to hardware stores, you can buy Live Edge Pine that's available. I think they're selling it at designer furniture nowadays. Everybody's getting into this market. And at the hardware store, a piece of pine like this will cost you a few hundred bucks. But oddly enough, we went to a designer wood supplier for this product. It's called Wood Source here in Ottawa, if you're in the area, okay? This particular pine counter was $160, right? And it is milled there. It's stored on site in climate control conditions so that it doesn't get twisted and warped. This slab is in immaculate condition. It's over 20 inches wide. It's still perfect. And you don't have to be concerned about that. Now, if you go to a box store, I don't know. Generally speaking, you're not gonna get the same kind of quality and you're not gonna get the same kind of customer service. That's for darn sure. And since it's half the price, it's a win-win. Here we go. Now this coat we're gonna go on nice and thick, right? And we're just gonna go over it a couple of times to make sure that we, we get rid of all of the extra drips because generally this is not gonna soak in the same way. We're looking more for that sheet of glass. And the way we're gonna finish this coat when we're done is we're gonna come back with some 4-0 steel wool. Now if you're not familiar with that rating, when you go to the hardware store in the paint department, you'll find steel wool available in little packages, use about eight or 10 bundles in a bag. And they're gonna have everything from two zero to five zero. And in the furniture refinishing business, steel wool is very common because it can be spun so fine that it barely sands anything at all. And you can use it to sand the finish of a gloss like this on a floor or a piece of furniture. Oh, here we go. And what it does is it sands it so fine you can't even see the marks when you're done. And that's why you want to use it. Because you can take something like a four or five zero on a finish coat on something like this, and it'll just become smooth as glass. There's no such thing as applying a finish smooth as glass. 
you actually have to sand it to be smooth as glass. So if you want it perfect, get a nice healthy coat on here on the third coat. All right, run it down, make sure there's no drips when you're done. And then when it's done drying, grab yourself your steel wool and just buff it with the steel wool and it will be perfect every time. Now, since this is gonna be in a bathroom and we don't want the bark to get damaged, you ready for this? We are doing this, three coats. We are absolutely dousing the bark, okay? We're gonna make this as bulletproof as we can just to make sure that we're not gonna have accidental chippage. Chippage, is that even a word? I think I just made a word. <laughs> Here we go, okay? And so here's the process. We're just gonna put way too much on here without any consideration for our own safety. Now you're gonna to wanna to get two or three coats on here as well. And then when you're, here you just go dab it over here with some blue cloth, okay? Just pick up the extra. There we go. Now that's gonna soak in. If there's a little bit sitting on the edge there, it's not gonna hurt anybody. It will dry clear, all right? But you definitely wanna make sure that in this situation, unlike painting, more is better. All right, on the top of the counter, less is better because you get a better finish. But here, we're dealing with just trying to protect this bark. So more is better, douse it really good, and then come back, just catch all the drips. Okay, now this has already got two coats. And you can see, it's got that nice shine, even though it's a flat finish, because it is absolutely saturated, okay? And that is the goal here. We want a counter that's not only smooth as glass and flat and shiny and waterproof, we want it to be really hard. We want the bark as hard as we can get it by soaking this stuff in there so it doesn't chip up when people are leaning up against it. Basically, I'm just gonna finish this off and then it'll be ready for install after we get the steel wool on that surface. <laughs> Loving it. Okay, we are at that point in the project where we have our drywall on, our tent mudding is done, ceiling's first coat paint, the wall's first coat paint, which we hate. <laughs> it happens. Sometimes when you have a space and it doesn't have the finished lighting in it, you know, you, you make your best judgment call and this is what happens. Anyway, it looks supposed to look a lot more steel blue, but in here it looks baby blue, so we're gonna be painting again. But that's not gonna slow us down. Remember we took all these pipes? We're just gonna thread them all back in now. We are finished. As soon as I can find this sweet spot, there it is. Okay, that was a whole lot of twisting for nothing. Okay, should follow my own advice. Go backwards until you feel it sit. Okay, now the reason this carries so much weight is because the threading, we're getting five or six threads deep on this thing which carries an immense amount of weight. That's why this system is so awesome. Just resist the temptation to hold the back end of that. That'll probably slice your hand open. Okay. That's awesome. Okay, here we go. We're in the doorway. So now you lay, no, 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 lay it flat. There you go. Nice and easy. Okay, now get it right to the back wall, right to the back wall. I'm uh, catching on the front side here. This is the best part of drywall. Hooray, it doesn't fit. <laughs> Gives us an opportunity to show you a little scribing technique. Now, this counter needs to go that way. I can see a screw popping already, which means we're putting the drywall on the wall under a lot of pressure. Over here, I'm really tight in the back, and I haven't even got my gap closed yet. So the front, when I push this back, is gonna open even more, which means it's probably perfect, okay? These pencils, carpenter pencils, come with a wide side and a skinny side for this exact reason. Scribing your wood, see that? And you just hold it up against your surface, and you can draw a line. Now when I do that, I'm taking an extra eighth off. I'm still way too tight, it won't be enough. So I'm gonna to go to the wide side and I'm gonna scribe this way. That takes me almost to perfect, to zero. All right, 
This is why we use these. If you need to go wider, you can even put your finger behind it and you can draw a straight line. Or you can take a piece of strapping and put it against the wall or any other flat surface for that matter. Okay, and you can follow the contour of the wall like that. The more warpy the wall is, the smaller the thing you want to use to be building up. So if it's really warped, use a finger. If it's relatively straight, use whatever's handy. Here we go. Higher. It's a good thing we're repainting the walls. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, you never finish painting a project like this until everything's installed. Nope. La 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 la. La 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 la. And, um, we can reduce the number of scratches in the wall, would be great. <laughs> we don't have to beat the crap out of everything. All right, so we're going to go back that far. We're not talking about a lot of meat. See that? That'll be fine. Amazing. What one eighth? One eighth of an inch. On the flat side, you end up, it's a one inch, one quarter inch thick. Mm. The center of the lead's a one eighth. One half, the center of the lead's at one corner. Perfect. Almost everything in life can be fixed with those two dimensions with a little bit of acrylic latex color. <laughs> All right, up we go. You're rotating it about me. Okay, lift it up, flatten it out. Get over your pipe. There you go. Okay. Up against the back wall first. Now, now watch this. This is how out of square the whole house is. Check your gap. You good over here. Good. And then we'll check it over here. Perfect. Now, this is our backsplash tile. And here's a cheap plug for myself. We're actually putting this one in as a herringbone backsplash. This is some awesome rich cover color. You're going to want to watch that video next. So the link will be in the description. Well, welcome to my world. <laughs> I'm underneath the counter here now, and we're going to use these awesome clips. These are actually for conduit pipe, but they're exactly the same diameter as the outside of the steel galvanized pipe. That is a great trick to know because this is available in the plumbing department. This is available in the electrical department at the Home Depot. And watch this. Ah, perfect fit. I mean, just amazing, especially when you're working upside down. And we're using an inch and a quarter screw. <laughs> How thick is my wood? <clears throat> no problem. Okay, always good to double check. Make sure you're not gonna drill through the other side because that would really be a bummer. Now, I'm gonna attach the clip at the front of this and the back of this because there's an overhang. Because the counter is inconsistent, we cut short on purpose and there's an overhang. So. We want to attach the front and the back on the two outside pipes. And the one in the middle, it doesn't need to be attached. It's really irrelevant. It's just there to help carry support the weight. Now we're going to go about an inch from the end, just so that we don't risk splitting the wood. And the drill functions really nice there too. When you're working on your back like this, set yourself up so it makes life simple. Here we go. Okay. Okay, we'll put our clips on. <laughs> That's an attractive look, eh? We have yet to finish this countertop. We still have to put on the last coat. Got a couple of tips and tricks for getting a glass-like finish, so let's get to that right away. Here we go. So this has got two coats of finish on already. And what we want to do now, I mean, it's smooth, it's, it's fine, it's pretty, it's sealed, all those good things, but it's not glass-like. Now this is steel wool, it's, this is a 4-0 steel wool. What I mean by that, the package literally has a rating system from three to coarse, or four zeros is fine. Four zeros is furniture polishing grade. You can take this and put it on any piece of furniture and polish it up. And this is what you use on the countertop. This is, this is what you use to polish any surface. Lacquer, varathane, oil base, water base, it doesn't matter. You use this to polish that surface just a quick rub like this, it's all it takes. I'm telling you right now, this is the difference between gorgeous and not gorgeous. Now, the other thing it does, it will leave little residues on there, okay? And you don't want to put another coat on there if you're going to have any steel residue, because steel will rust. And you don't want to get that trapped in your finished coat. So take your rags, 
wipe it and throw it away. Okay? It's kind of like grouting. <laughs> you just wipe it and throw it away. And if you follow that procedure, you're not going to have any steel fibers left on your countertop when you come back for your last coat. And again, just like every other coat, start on the edge, follow the grain, and just pull it to the middle. All right? This will be your third coat. This will make it absolutely gorgeous. And the crazy thing is, is when this coat is dry, you can get that same steel wool, come back and give it a light polish. And now that it's got three coats, and the reason we waited to the, do the third coat until it was in place, is because we knew we were gonna do some cutting, right? And we didn't want to have our final piece on here until after the cutting was all done. Here we go, nice and liberal. Now we're gonna just drag and stretch this out. There's no plowing towards us. Here we go. In this video, I am going to install a herringbone tile, boom, as a backsplash in this rustic modern bathroom. Now, this is two and a half by 24, so it's gonna be some really delicate detailed work, but I got a simple way to get it done. So stay with us and I'll show you all my tips and tricks and you can be a tile master too. So because this product is officially going on a wall and it's not in a wet area, we're just going with an adhesive. This is OmniGrip. This particular adhesive is available at your local building store and it has a really good bonding strength. So it's got enough bonding strength to hold this tile in place on the wall. <sighs> Having said that, we're gonna be using spacers just to help make sure all of our grunt lines are very consistent. Now, I'm, here's the secret number one. When you buy spacers for your tile job, get two different sizes. I got 1 16th and 1 8th. The reason for that is simple. Sometimes when you're tiling, you need to change the grout line in order to finish. So in this particular case, we measured it out a little bit in advance, and we found that we might be just perfect herringbone finish to the edge of the wall if we go with the 1 16th spacer. Now, if that doesn't end up working out, I also got the 1 8th in case I need it, but it's good to have options. Now, of course, if you're a fan of the channel, you've seen my videos before, you know I love my laser. And we're gonna just throw that on here. I've already made my center line. You'll see that it's in line with my box, which of course is gonna be in the center of my light. And I like to install everything very, very symmetrical, especially in a bathroom. Small spaces, you cannot afford to work left to right. You gotta start in the middle and work your way out. So now I got my line established, that is good. The trick, of course, with herringbone is that it overlaps. So you've got to decide what's your center line. Is it the point or is it halfway through the tile where it overlaps? That's the magic. Visually, that point is going to be the center, whether you like it or not. So if I install my tile like this and like this on that center line, visually that's stunning, okay? But this is what happens over here. Boom. Perfect finish, right? And that is what we're going for. So, the trick with herringbone is you don't want to start with at, at the bottom row because that's all a little bunch of little cut pieces. You want to start with your full tile and you want to get the full dimension all laid out and squared in. So what we're going to use is a few of these little wood screws, okay? And we're going to put some adhesive on the wall. We're going to get our first four tiles in place and we're going to use our framing square because it's already got a perfect 45 on it. We're going to set that on our level countertop and then install all of our stone based on that. Flush to that and flush to the counter and that'll be my line, okay? So I can install that stone like that anywhere I want and it'll be absolutely perfect. Now. In order to apply our adhesive, we are using this trowel here. This is a quarter by quarter square notch trowel. It does a great job of spreading a nice bead of adhesive that also doesn't put too much on the wall, so when you press your stone into it, it doesn't come squeezing out between the tile. One other thing you want to consider when you're doing a project like this is the total square footage of the space. We have 26 and a half square feet from the countertop to the ceiling, so that's what we're going to cover. So I bought exactly 26 and a half square feet of stone. The danger being, it's not going to be enough with all the little cuts to cover the whole space. But I'm cheating to save some money because this stone was crazy expensive. And I know that my mirror 
is going to be this big. Okay, I just drew that out with my marker. So I don't need to fill the whole thing up. I want to leave a, a hole in the wall here on purpose so that I can still fish my wire up to the box so I can bring my low voltage power to the mirror so that it doesn't fog up. There we go. So to get started, I'm going to just trowel in the general vicinity of where I know that tile is going to go. And then I'll clean up as I go here. We're going to just kind of guesstimate for now. All right, we'll set our tiles on. That's going to need a little bit more here, I think. And you see how that holds it? That actually holds the tile off the counter without any difficulty at all. Now what I don't know is if this is a perfect 45 yet, so... That's what I have to take care of right now. Now I always love to have a little bit of cardboard on my countertops when I'm working, just to help protect my surface. Okay, so here we go. Now, I have to change my angle first. Now that's my 45. Okay. Rough me there, but I want to get this on my center line, right? So now we'll slide it over. Okay. Almost perfect. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. <laughs> now the first couple of tiles are going to be the most difficult and the messiest. Keep everything nice and clean while you're working. Because it's going to be probably about a couple of hours before we get back to this area down here. We don't want to have dried up glue building up in the corners. It's hard to clean out afterwards. Like I said, we got our 1 16th spacers. We'll get those out now. Let's continue on with our pattern. We want to take it from here and then upwards towards the wall. So this is where it gets interesting. Remember when we talked about where the center line is on this and that peak generally is where the center line is? Visually, that looks like the center. But the truth of it is, the center is right here. It's down the middle of this. So when I put this on the wall, I actually am coming shy of the wall over here by an inch. And this tile doesn't fit. So I have a choice to make. Depending on the situation, if you have a traditional sink and a center faucet and you offset this a little bit, you're going to run into a design issue where it's going to look silly having all of the peaks to the side of the faucet. Like you can just imagine if your faucet's here and it's all off an inch, okay? It might look silly. But for me, because I'm using a stone sink and my faucet's already offset, my mirror's so huge, I really don't have a center line issue to deal with. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually send that over off the wall and I'm going to reposition all of my tile so that I can finish wall to wall center with a full stone over here as well. Wow, that's going to be amazing. This is where using these 1 16th spacers comes in really handy just to make sure that we got everything the way we want it. Now, let's see if we can get the last piece of our initial design in place here. This is nuts. The fact that this is going to work is crazy. 
Let's just uh, get this one in now. Now we know this doesn't happen every time, and this is a little bit crazy, but I got some perfect W. That's the new wow factor. <laughs> All right, uh, yeah. So we got lucky for the purpose of this video. This actually worked out really well. Um, in this particular situation, this is a five and a half foot wall. So consider that if you're gonna get these 23 and three quarter tiles. Wow, <sighs> I might have to remember that math for the future. This is a great design element. Now, if it doesn't fit, of course you have to cut the edges on both sides, right? Balance it out. Because in this situation, if Let's say this tile was a little bit too long and I started with full pieces there and this side had all the cuts, it would start to look a little bit odd. So you really want to balance it out. But you can see that my center line travels through both of these tiles because that's the true center, even though the tip of the W was offset. Anyway, just a little tip there. Let's get on with applying the adhesive. And of course the secret here to doing this is get some of these tiles in play first. Right? You don't want to go too far with filling up all the little bits until you actually have your pattern established. Visually, it's really easy to make a mistake when you're doing this. So we want to just start filling in all of these gaps. All right? Let's get a, the next few rows in at least here. This tile is actually against the wall and against the counter. It's not going anywhere. So. We just got to continue our pattern now. Set it in nice and tight. Grab your spacer. Right. One there and one down here. And then one here. Now I know that this particular adhesive will do most of the work. But especially for now, in the early stages, we want to just be extra careful. Now one of the benefits using adhesive here instead of cement is that it cleans out a lot easier. Okay, You can come back with a sponge tomorrow and clean out all of this extra adhesive. You can just get it wet and it'll wipe out and then you can grow really easily without getting too much of that residue stuck in between the tile. Okay, there we go. We'll go the other side again. I haven't mentioned how much I love this tile, Max. <laughs> So the reason I picked this tile is because I really was looking for a, something with a little bit of punch, right? Something with a little bit of a dramatic flair. Wow, I definitely found it. These deep, rich colors. It's just, I don't like to paint my bathrooms a dark color if I can get away with it, especially in a room without a window. So this allows me to keep my walls, even though this is a light gray, a little on the lighter side, and then put all my drama at the, on the short walls at both ends. That makes everything really, really pretty. Okay, Matt. Let's crank on the wet saw. Because the wet saw does such a good job cutting these edges, I want you to take one piece of tile, cut me a series of triangles. Now for this particular project, I'm going to be using unsanded grout, which is pretty much necessary anytime you've got a, a grout line this thin. Now there's an option. They have grouts out there that uh, have a, a polymer additive that help dry really quick. And it's an unsanded grout as well, but it's a little bit different in that it, you really gotta be able to work fast. And in this situation, I don't think I wanna be rushed. So I'm gonna be much more happy working a little slower with a standard grout and giving it time to dry properly. Look at that, see that? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw in a screw here just to hold the weight so that it doesn't slip underneath the weight as I'm building the tile wall. So 
So one of the ways that we're going to save on material is I'm not going to fill a lot of this area here because it's all behind the mirror. But I do need to have, this is my mirror outline, this side taken care of. Now if I cut this tile in half, put that on, it's too short. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to just finish stacking these right to the ceiling. Here we go. One of these tubs with this type of trowel does around 20 to 25 square feet. It's mostly designed for kitchen backsplash, which is averages of 18 in a weird way. So we're going to just get all that on and keep on trucking here. So what I'm going to do is, and this is how I'm cheating, right? So now I'm dropping my laser line off my corners to help keep myself in a position. Now when you're using a wet saw to do the cuts, it ends up with the same effect as if you were cutting and polishing the stone in the same move. So I can cut both directions. I can actually line this up on the ceiling, not in the adhesive, with my grout line, and then make my mark on my my stone right here. Okay? That represents where the stone ends. And then I just take my square, draw that line with my marker, and I'm going to have them cut that stone for me. And then I'm going to finish off all the exposed area above here in line with these cut lines. It'll look really cool. You're going to have to trust me on this and see how it finishes. We really want to make sure that as we go, we're always establishing that 90 degree corner. And if it's out a little bit, make a minor adjustment, okay? That's really nice. Then, measuring and cutting is easy. Always measure on the long side. So you put your tape, you're pressing it up against the ceiling right where the tile will finish. And you take your measurement, you read 15 and a half, translate that information, right? Make our mark. And then you double check by holding it up backwards. Okay, and make sure that you've got an eighth plus, maybe even two eighths, maybe, maybe a full quarter there. You can split the difference and have grout line at the ceiling and at the wall. That is good. So I'm going to take my triangle now. I'm going to draw the line I want to cut on the stone so that he doesn't accidentally cut it shorter. All right, and that's how you do it so that you always end up getting exactly what you want. You always make your line on the outside of the actual stone you want to keep so you can cut that mark away. Perfect every time. There's my next three. So what, I, what we're doing around the box is we actually are using a, a grinder with a porcelain bit on it. And that gives you the ability to cut all these fancy little shapes. We want to have as tight to the box as we can so that the light fixture actually mounts over that and we don't have any holes showing. So it looks like that's going to work out really well. Here's this stone here. Bam. There's the proof that keeping everything square works. I can meet up the pattern after the fact. Like I said, this is all behind the mirror, so I'm not worried about that piece right there. fill it in a space like that, instead of trying to put the adhesive on the wall first, you can always put it directly onto the tile. Okay? Just got to be a little bit careful. You don't want to leave too much on there and have it squeezing out. Like I said, this is not a wet area, so 90% coverage is not necessary. Just make sure you put enough on that it actually sticks to the wall. what I'm looking for. Okay, so I'm just putting a couple of my leftover pieces near the top because I need to have stone underneath my light fixture. Okay, let's get all that nice and flush. If you're going to put the glue on the tile first, 
Make sure it is nice and flush. Okay. Squeeze it all together. And then you can open them up when you're done. Create that grout space. There we go. Once it's squeezed in nice and tight like that, it'll hold itself really well. Oop. We're going to throw a little extra support here now. Use the head of the screw. I'll show you my little secret here. If I come in on an angle here, just underneath, my head of my screw actually picks up the weight. And it'll actually pull everything nice and tight. So the next piece goes here in the pattern, and then here. So then I actually want to measure from here to that ceiling. This is one of these situations where not everything is square, right? So my tile is a perfect 45. My pattern is perfect. I end up with a, a gap, zero to hero here. And I don't want that to show. So I'm actually going to recut this angle with just a little bit, closing up a little bit. Once I've cut that, then I'll get my length. <laughs> Difficult to know exactly what your measurements are in some situations, especially with these inside corners. So I think it's 17 and a half. I'm going to cut it at 17 and 5 eighths. And I can bring like this, measure it, sorry. I'll put my tip down. Perfect. I love it. So now I know. The angle is actually here. I'm going to mark where I want them to cut. Good. So here we are, we have this situation up at the top. And you have two options for doing this sort of thing. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take our pattern. That's our pattern, okay? We're gonna lay it on the counter, put in our grout line, and then we're gonna measure, we're gonna measure the bottom of that line there. And that one comes in at four and three eighths. Four and a half. We simply put our tile together and then we trace our line. So we'll start with four and a half at the corner. Take my mark. And then we'll take our straight edge across both stones at once. That way, when you cut this, you're finished, nice straight line. If you measure each of these individually, you're gonna mess up that joint and it's gonna show. So when you get down to an area like this, you can actually take three, four, five stones all in the pattern, measure the outside, draw the straight line, and then cut all of those cuts at the same time. That'll really speed the process up. That gets you a perfect cut, but more importantly, it makes sure that the grain of the tile is going in the right direction. If you're not careful and you just use an off cut, you'll end up with the grain always heading in the same direction. It always looks funny from a distance. It's amazing how a little detail like the grain of that stone can make such a huge difference. Real careful around your drywall corners because they're not going to be perfectly 90. I like to throw a little dollop of adhesive in the middle of the stone so I can balance it and wiggle it around. Get it all nice and smoothed out. Okay. Well, there we go. That's going to look pretty good. Now, listen, I understand that this is not a complete wall. Finishing the wall is simple, but uh, I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't going to run into difficulty with not having enough stone. So I have to have a hole in the wall here anyway, because I'm going to bring this feed here for my heated mirror. So next is I'm going to drill the hole. We're going to let this dry, and then we're going to grout this as well. Ah, so stay tuned, because we're going to grout this in this video, because we're going to show some tips and tricks for doing that sort of thing, and how to get a nice finished look. And if you like this kind of content, make sure to subscribe to the channel. Don't forget, 
If you're interested in learning a lot about renovations and you've got some major projects coming up, we have a members program. So hit the join button, take a look at that. I make myself a lot more available nowadays to people who are looking to get lots of information, have questions about their own projects. All right, so we'll see you back in a couple hours or in your case, just a couple seconds and we'll get back to grouting. Now here's a special message for everybody who's looking at this wall going, what the hell? <laughs> we are gonna be hanging a huge mirror here and I need access to this string because this is my feeder line for my low voltage wire that goes to the heating system behind my mirror so it doesn't fog up. So the reality is, is I could have installed the mirror first and actually tiled around it, but that would look a little ridiculous and this is easier to function this way. This way I can keep my, my lines perfect, I can fill all my gaps, and I'm gonna have a really perfect look when I'm done. So this is why I've done what I've done. No need to install tile here, I needed to have this hole. So since it's not gonna be a perfect finish wall, no matter what I do, just, it's just the way I roll. Anyway, we have been a few hours and the glue is all dry. One of the benefits of using a high performance adhesive is that you can grout at the end of the day without any delay. Oh, it just rhymed. Weird. All right. <laughs> I uh, just generally pull these out and then save them, put them back in the package where they came from. Have a pair of pliers handy. If any of them are giving you any trouble because they're actually embedded in some adhesive, then you can just yank them out like that, right? Not a big deal. The process here is pull the plastics, give it a wash, make sure we don't have any adhesive on the surface or trapped in the corners, and then we're going to put our grout in and wait about five or 10 minutes and then we'll wash it right off. Then we're gonna see how it looks in. All right. Well, one of the benefits of herringbone is that all the tile's already on at 45 degree. So all you have to do is go straight up and down and straight left and right. And you've already, you've got all your angles proper. Uh, tippy toe time. Don't forget, one of the advantages of having all your finished paintwork that's about two days old is that you can wash the grout off as part of the process without damaging the walls. One of the reasons why the tile guy is the only guy to come into the new home build before the other flooring guy comes. So it goes tile after the painter, which is amazing when you think about it. And of course, because this is a 1 8 grout line, or sorry, 1 16th, we're using an unsanded grout. The gaps would be just too small to get the sanded grout to work. Now I'm gonna finish off at my ceiling with the uh, concave part of the float. The goal here is to leave a little bit of grout filling that gap and then I'm going to use a translucent silicone or clear at the top so that you don't have a, an ugly silicone line. There we go. So you really want to make sure you fill all the little gaps up there when you're using that process. I just found when you add white silicone onto a white ceiling, it looks like trash because the ceiling is a flat white, and the silicone is a shiny white. Using the clear silicone instead of the white just gives you a better look. It makes the, makes the tile work the star. It doesn't draw attention to itself. <laughs> it's funny, you know, Max? Getting all OCD about this. Truth is, I only need to grout about one foot perimeter on the outside of this thing. That's all you're ever gonna see. <laughs> okay, so when you're done, make sure you clean it off with the grout float as best you can. Makes it a lot easier to wash the tile afterwards. Now, this is obviously is not a comprehensive tutorial on how to grow, but if you'd like to see one, we're gonna have a link to a video in the description below. We have a comprehensive how to grow. We did it in the uh, tub shower surround. Great video, lots of information there if you're learning how to do all this stuff for the first time. Now on Sunday grow, when you mix it thick like I just did, has a benefit you can wash right away if you're careful. Just one pass though. If you wash it more than once, you're gonna wash all of the dye out of the mix. And it won't be the color that you thought it was supposed to be.
right now that we're washed there's still a couple things we have to do we need quality control so you take a little blob of your grout left over from your pail and you really want to just go through this really small area of time focusing real hard and don't just look down actually get down get right and see here we go okay so we just take this little bit and smudge it in there's one there and leave it messy here we go okay now I just leave that sit for a few minutes to set up and then we'll come back and give it a wipe. And the reason you do it ugly like that is so that you can find it later. Nothing worse than going back and going, ah, oh, I missed a bump. Because then you're going to have to sand it and grind it. It's just a lot of work. So leave it messy. Give it five minutes. Wipe it up. And then when all of the grout is nice and dry on the surface, then you can come along and go with your clear silicone and seal up all, all four edges. Anytime you're changing a surface plane, you want to add some silicone. And when that's all finished, your backsplash is done. All you got to do is hang your light mirror. Good to go. It is really humid in here. For some reason, it always seems to be raining when we're doing a grout job. <laughs> Unbelievable. So we're going to get a fan in here and blow this up for about 10, 15 minutes. Get the surface dry so we can show you how to finish this off. So in today's video, I'm installing a huge mirror on a tiled wall. But the cool thing about it is the fact that it's going to have a heating system in behind it so that it never fogs up from the use of a shower. So really all you need is your laser level that everyone should own by now. If you don't, you can check it out on Amazon. We have our link in the description. You can buy one there. And some painter's tape, and a couple of measuring and cutting tools. It's not that tricky. I'm just going to throw a piece of tape on the back of my mirror because I want to get all my measurements. Okay. I set my mirror on my counter and I can measure my space to the ceiling. I got 23 inches. I also have a light going to be going in here, so I want to double check. If I split the difference, 11 and a half, it's a little too close. So I'm going to go with 12 inch clearance on the top, which makes an 11 inch clearance on the bottom. So I'm going to go plus 11 inches from where I'm sitting. Okay. And my mirror comes with these two hangers. And what we're going to do is just use simple wall plug system. We're going to drill through the tile, install a couple of these wall plugs. All right. And each of these will carry 80 pounds. So that's not going to be a problem. Now the trick here is to get it centered. So what I want to do is put a measurement on my mirror, 48. Mark my center on the mirror. And I want to measure my wall. It's going to be 68 and a half. That's 34 and a quarter. And I recommend writing down every one of your numbers as you go along. All right, now I know the center line is roughly underneath this center of this box because we centered that as well. So 34 and a quarter. We're going to go here. I'm going to mark my center line. And there we go. So that's going to be my center line. I'll measure left and right from. Okay. So now I'm physically going to line my center line of my mirror roughly where that is. Perfect. And I'll take some tape now, put it on the wall, right above my mounts. Okay, now I am going to measure plus 11 inches from this will be the top of the mirror. And that's what we want, the top of the mirror mark, plus 11 inches. Okay. Now we're going to measure down on each side because we don't know if the, the mirror mounts are actually hung level. So on the right side, it's four inches. On this side, it's a little bit more. So that four inches translates over to here because we're going to be turning it around. This is going to be the height of where I put my hole. And over here, I'm going to be measuring down four inches and a bit. Okay. Now, Max, I have no idea why I've got a laser level involved with this. And once again, we're going to work off our center lines to measure our locations here, okay? So I put my tape measure there. It's 22 and 3 eighths. So I'm going to measure from here. 22 and 3 eighths. Right there. It's 22 and a quarter, which is why it's important to do this. Now at the end of the day, if your measurements are out a 32nd of an inch or so, it's not the end of the world. Okay, <laughs> here we go. Now we're going to put this on low speed 
and on hammer drill because I don't like to waste my time. Yes, I'm gonna burn through the bit a little prematurely, but I like to get things done. You know, that's a perfect uh, point here. For years, people have been telling me, you know, you can't use a glass and tile bit on high speed with hammer drill. <laughs> I mean, why not? It works. It's quick. Yeah, it's a little noisy, but if it bothers you, you can wear hearing protection. There we go. Now, I use a quarter inch, quarter inch glass and tile bit. And this one here, it's from Bosch. It's pretty decent. It's got a little bit of life left in it. We're gonna use it for hanging our glass door in our shower next. There we go. Now I buy my plastic wall plugs with the screws in the same kit, so I know they're gonna work. They got a nice big head on them. It'll hook onto that no problem. All right, tape measure, love it. This is my rubber hammer. As far as the depth is concerned, you only need to have enough space between the back of the head of the screw and the tile for this to fit in snug and I'll help hold the mirror in place. So don't leave it out hanging out too far. Okay. Now because we're making videos here, I still have to install my sink and my tap. And if I mount this mirror first, it's going to be really difficult to get that job done. So we're going to put this aside for a second, finish the plumbing. We'll finish this video right now. Okay, so our electrical inspector came by yesterday, popped his head in real quick, took a look, checked the spacing on the mat on the floor, and everything is according to the way it's supposed to be, so he approved the installation. He asked me an interesting question though. He asked me if the thermostat had a sensor cable as well, and so I wasn't sure, and I opened up the box, and sure enough, there was. Now, the installation instructions doesn't call for installing a second sensor, but he gave me that advice that since the most common failure is the sensor, if you have a second one, install it in advance in case the first one fails, then you can change the wiring in the box over to the second sensor. So we ran that second line and now they're both installed. We're ready to put down our flooring. So here we go. Now, luxury vinyl plank is different than the lower cost vinyl plank. That's really easy to just score and snap with a knife, okay? We're gonna demonstrate Three different cutting techniques for you. Well, actually, one, two, three. Yeah, we're gonna show you five different tools that you can cut this stuff with today so that you can you know, use what you have available at home or you might choose to go out and invest in something if you're gonna do a lot of flooring. Now, traditionally, this kind of flooring is it's what I would call um, a beginner level installation because it's just measure and cut, right? All you have to do is mark and go ahead and install it. Vinyl flooring does not expand with heat and humidity. I'm so tired of hearing that all over the industry. And this is going to be contentious because uh, when it first came out, the advice was just tell everybody when they ask about it to treat it like laminate flooring. But it isn't like laminate flooring. The reality is this product has an expansion of something ridiculous like less than one half of 1%. So in my world, that's a zero expansion because I don't have temperature fluctuations that are gonna cause that kind of happen. Even though I'm heating the floor, I'm not worried about this buckling. So we're gonna install this today tight to the wall. We're not using clips, we're not using spacers. We're not getting weird about it. We're just gonna cut and measure as you see it fit. All we do is line up, we have a tongue and we have a groove. And we're gonna make sure the groove is always facing out. It's so much easier to install that way. Okay, and this is our water line, and we're just gonna mark with a marker where that line is. And then I'm going to get an idea if I cut the first inch, right? You don't even need a measuring tape for this, folks. Just go ahead and do that. Now, the easiest way to cut this is actually with a jigsaw. You just set this on a little platform and you can cut it out, no problem at all. Let me give this to Matt. Matt's helping me today. Okay, now the next board, we're gonna want to stagger our joints. Okay, so we're gonna want this next joint to be about a foot away. 
So I'm actually going to take one foot of this board off because we're going to demonstrate the score and snap technique and see how well this works or doesn't work on the luxury vinyl. And just use your little square. And then nice to have a guide for your knife so you don't accidentally cut your thumb. And the trick here is you flip it upside down and then apply pressure. Ugh. Okay, now, just to give you an idea here. That gives you a decent edge, right? No one's gonna be complaining about that. And it can be pretty handy, but if you aren't really strong, you might find that difficult. I'm gonna keep that handy for a little later on. There we go. Now, that is perfect. Now this kind of flooring is what we call a um, floating floor installation, okay? You just set it down and it just sits there. It makes life really simple. Now, the next piece, we're going to just adjust it so that we can measure. Now, if you've been following this series along from the beginning, you know that we put this orange mat down and the piece of this flooring right at the very beginning in order to set the height for our transition, our little metal edge that goes off the tile. And the secret here is you want to cut the floor underneath the metal and the stone. So we're not cutting up here, we're cutting behind it because it'll slide right underneath. So we just set that for measurement, go slide your floor right up to your, your shower pan, and then pull it off about an eighth of an inch. Because you don't want this, when you're walking, to be rubbing up against this. When we're all finished, we'll add a bead of silicone to hold everything in place. But for now, that's how we're gonna do it. Same thing over here, we're just gonna measure Make a mark there, because that's where the wall is, behind this trim. Then I'll just take my trusty little square and draw my lines and send this off to the saw. There we go. Now I'll hand that over to Matt at the jigsaw, and he'll show you how well this cuts. Now the easiest way to put this flooring together is to get it on an angle and then slide it and then it sits in that groove real easily. Okay, slide it right underneath where we have it there. Now because we want a staggered floor, I like to go with at least three panels. So that's about a third. The next one we're gonna go about a half distance. So I just lay this down backwards and then you measure this. That ends up being the mark that you're gonna cut at so that the cut goes against the finished shower pan. And that's where the silicone goes. Here we go, now. There you go. You just gotta set it in the groove and lay it down. Here's my next piece for over here. Here's my groove sitting out. I'm gonna flip it around, lay it where it goes, and then get my mark. And I'm gonna mark that somewhere between an eighth and a quarter inch shy just because the rooms are never square, and that'll make life easy. Now here you just set the end in. Wow. All right, so when you're cutting around your toilet flange, you really wanna get your flooring as tight to the flange as possible. And the best way to do that is just to measure off a middle spot, just based on this line here. So that's, that's where my toilet flange is, and I'm just going to put a mark there. Now this is all going to be underneath the toilet, so you don't have to worry about it at this point. You can also come up here, and mark there, okay, and come over here, where it's flush across the front, and just mark where that flange is there. Now the toilet flange is about seven inches in diameter. So I can go from line to line, mark my three and a half, and that becomes like a pivot point. So what I do, so I like to put my knuckle on the pivot point, reach out with my marker, okay, find my spot, and you'll find that this works out pretty darn good almost all the time. Okay, there we go. 
Yeah, you take the jigsaw, you cut relative to that. <clears throat> pick a line. <laughs> pick a line. Somewhere in the middle there will probably work out real well. <laughs> ah, that's funny, Matt. Pick a line. Okay. There we go. Get it in the groove. And then it just locks into place. Now here's one of these situations. If life doesn't treat you kind and your cuts off a little bit, most cases when you're adding new flooring to your house, your toilet flange will be too low for a proper toilet installation. And you're gonna be adding a flange, extension ring, some sort of a build-up system. And so you're gonna to have to chisel your floor back to expose that whole ring. Vinyl, it's awesome to work with. It's easier than wood, okay? You can just take any hammer and chisel, and if you need to ch chip it out, you, you can. All right, sometimes having the old fashioned basic tools are really handy. So now we're gonna measure a little piece to fill at the end, and it's really tiny, right? Here we go. Again, take one eighth or quarter off. Now, just for fun, we're gonna show you what it's like to try to cut this with the score and snap technique. <sighs> that's a lot of work, and that's dangerous. Wow. <laughs> now, I'm going to show you a couple of other tools that were invented to make life easier. Okay, we'll put a fake line on here. And then, uh, Matt, I'm going to have you show the world. We have two different Roberts floor cutters here. One is a commercial unit I've used a lot, over a lot of years, and it was around $400. And, well, wow, that unit, I've cut, I don't know, tens of thousands of feet of flooring with it. The other one is one I picked up on Amazon not too long ago. We actually did a special video just demonstrating how good it was. Perfect for the homeowner if you're only doing one or two rooms. It was 60 bucks. Same company, totally different system, but it works. It's just a little bit more manually demanding. But it's a lot easier than scoring and snapping. Here we go. Well, you put the mark on the other end. Right? So that works, right? Okay, hang on. So that's the $60 tool. It cuts and it works, but it's a lot easier with the good one. And now my old $400 tool. That's it. That was easy. So here we are. Just gotta finish translating this information for the rest of this. And you can use your square and just measure the gap. I'm about two inches in. So about two inches in is there. And so then we will just finish drawing this little circle. All right, and we'll send that off to the jigsaw. Okay, here we go. Line it all up in the groove, slide it in nice and tight. There we go. That's amazing. I'm gonna get a few more pieces in here. So all of these end pieces that I cut, I keep them and I flip them over. And I like to keep them for reference to fill my, fill my rows if I can use it all up. So this is gonna be a perfect opportunity to use this piece. I'm gonna use it up right now. Here we go, we'll get that cut. So there, there are two basic theories on how to install this flooring. One, you lay the piece down, you bring your next piece, you butt, put the butt end in, okay? Coming shy of the rest of the flooring. And that helps make sure that that joint there is locked. All right, and then you have to Lift everything together and then force it in. There you go. That's, that's a good joint. The other way to do it is put your row together. Depending on the size of your room, this could be easier, it could be difficult. Put your row, your row together first and then you put the whole row in at the same time. My experience with this type of flooring that's almost next to impossible. You'll find that with vinyl, it's just too flexible. 
With laminate floor, you can get away with that. But with vinyl, it just seems to be too difficult to work with unless you have two or three people working with you. So I like to get my butt joint in. Okay. Now the truth is, the first couple of rows are the most difficult. But once you can get on the other side of the flooring, then you're in a position. You can just lift and snap. So for everybody who does not have a table saw, you can still use this. If you have a jigsaw, you can cut flooring, you can cut anything. This is what a technique I use all the time. You just hold the saw still and you pass the flooring through the blade. Here we go. Perfect every time. And of course, you can always use a chop saw for cutting just about anything. If it's plugged in. <laughs> we got power here now? <laughs> Razor sharp. Catch. Okay. Depending where you are and what situation you're in, you might have a door installed already. This is a new build for me. And when I'm doing a new build with vinyl flooring, I put the doors on last. The reason being, I get everything nice and tight. I don't have to cut around the trim. I don't have to use caulking. My door jam sits right on top of the floor. And that is perfect. Like I said, I'm not afraid of expansion contraction because it's not gonna happen. Okay, last piece of vinyl. I love these ends, they just lay right in place. There we go, this floor is finished. All right, so now I've showed you how to install the flooring and the heating system, but we're not done yet because whenever you're doing a project like this, you've also got to trim it. So I'm gonna show you real quick my favorite ways to install baseboards and caulk it so that you don't have a lot of touch-up work. It's crazy fast. I'm gonna show you another system for fixing your toilet flange too. Adjusting the height of your toilet flange is part of your floor install. If you don't consider that, then you're gonna be having a huge mess trying to install your toilet and it's not gonna seal properly. So before I show you all my finishing tips and tricks, just wanna give a shout out to Mohawk Flooring. Uh, the company Znet Flooring has actually supplied the flooring for this project and they're an online flooring supplier, okay? So you guys can go online, we'll put the link in the description below and you can check them out. You can get free flooring samples, I think, delivered to your house. Make sure you got the right colors and textures They've got the whole line of luxury vinyl product. So if you're having a hard time finding a good quality vinyl in your area, then this is definitely a resource that I would recommend. So for anybody who's done flooring before, you know, in a bathroom especially, half of the work is putting the floor down, the other half is finishing it all off. So I'm gonna share with you my tips and tricks today. This is just MDF baseboard. It comes with a primer. Really, it only needs one coat of finished paint. But if you use a nail gun to stick it on, you're gonna to need to do all kinds of patching and everything else, and it will drive you absolutely bonkers. Because you're gonna to have to pull out the compressor, and fire in the nails, and then you gotta putty the nails. If you use this adhesive right here, and it's just what it says, it's no more nails. That product right there. It's just an adhesive for installing trim. Okay, ready for this? Done. All right, now your trim's installed. And if you're in a hurry and you want to finish the product quick, get this product. This is the Alex Fast Dry, okay? This is not your typical door and window caulking. The typical stuff takes almost two hours to set up before you can paint it. This stuff is 20 minutes. And the way you imply that is just put an angle on the tip and then you just pull it across, fill in your holes, and you take a damp sponge and then you're done. 20 minutes from now, I can come by and start painting. Now it'll take me about 20 minutes to trim out the whole room. So if I start in one corner, 
when I'm done trimming, I just pull out my brush and I can finish paint and I'm done. And when you're all finished your paint job, you can put in a little bit of white pure silicone, go to the inside corners and just fill in the corners and you're finished, okay? Now for the plumbing, we're gonna use what's called pipe flange cover. This one's a split pipe flange cover. And this is in case you've already got your plumbing run. If this is copper and you've already got a shut off valve on top of this, you can't slide this over top because it's exactly the diameter of the pipe. Now that looks real pretty. But if you've already got your shutoff valve on there, and I use shark bite for this reason, it's that simple. Okay. And <laughs> there we go. Then this split pipe flange is the solution for you. It has a little bit of a crease in it, and you'll see it. And the chrome will actually split open. And you can wrap it around your pipe and put the split on the back side so nobody sees it. And you've got a decorative perfect finish in seconds. And we don't need that because the toilet riser will have the, the proper fitting for there. And then the next trick, it'll save you a ton of time. And more than time, this is going to save you from having a flood. When I worked in the trades, the number one callback was for toilets that leaked. I can't even tell you how many hundreds and hundreds of toilets. Oh, it's just crazy. And these are professional plumbers and selling this stuff, but they all cheat. But since it's your house, you're not going to cheat. Here's a solution that'll work really well for you. Okay, this comes with a little bolt extension pack here. This is a PVC ring. It's the same material that the toilet flange is made out of already. All right, and it's got the same holes lined up here. It works out perfect for setting your bolts, okay? So you put your extra long bolts in place, all right? Line them up so they're somewhat parallel here, okay? Before you put this ring on, you put on this gasket seal over top. And this is where everybody misses it. I've seen so many plumbers come along and they'll try to use silicone or something else. It always fails. Unbelievable. Without fail, it fails. <laughs> Now, we're going to stick this ring on and we're going to pull it almost to the extent because you want to have a little bit of flexibility with this, all right? Now, you can at this point take screws and screw this flange down. That's definitely an option. Then the other thing you do is it comes with these holes already made. This is a rubber gasket for the toilet to sit on. Okay? Now, this is amazing. Because this one is made for situations like an old house. If your toilet is on here and your house is moving in the winter time, there's a little bit of movement here and there, and the toilet might be tight this one, and then move over here one day. Old houses like this, the floor is constantly moving with this kind of seal. No matter what happens on top of this, the toilet, this is compressed and then it grows back again to keep your seal. If you use wax and you put pressure on that wax, if your toilet moves a little bit, you've broken the seal and now water can seep out. So this kind of gasket is a perfect solution for older homes. The secret that you want to know is this. Yeah. The new ring has to be higher than the floor. Okay? Just by an eighth of an inch. All right? If you, if you can't slide your square across the ring, it's too low. So get an extension. Make sure you're an eighth of an inch above your floor. And then there are other extension packs out there for more dramatic situations. They've got a half inch and a quarter inch rise and you can stack them together and they have more of those gaskets in it as well. But here's the situation. As long as you do this, put your toilet on, right? Tighten down with your bolts. You are gonna be good to go, all right? And that is how you install a floor. Knowing how to put your toilet back is the most important part of any flooring installation. Okay, so today's video, guys, we're going to be installing this beautiful hewn out stone sink. Now, it doesn't have an overflow system, so it takes special plumbing, so stay with us. We're also going to put in our tap that goes along with that. We're going to connect all the plumbing underneath so that you can finish your bathroom vanity all by yourself, all right? So when you're installing your vanity sink plumbing, really only one thing to be concerned about, and that is aesthetics, right? How does it look? So what we've done is we've just taken our center line, I've measured across, put my framing square there, and I'm gonna mark my center line on my tape, and I'm gonna put a lot of tape now, front to back, right over that center line. 
Now what I do is I can set the sink on my counter knowing that I'm on the center. Now the question is do I want it pulled forward or pushed back? This particular sink is going with this really cool waterfall faucet and the idea here is this is our guest bathroom. It's really only designed for occasional use, hand washing, wash, brushing your teeth, that's about it, right? We're not doing any laundry here, so we can have this faucet set back. The water basically cascades down into the sink. And I can set it up on this angle. I like that. I think I like it more lined up on the center of the hole. That looks good to me. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my marker and just put a mark underneath the center of the location that I like. And that'll mark where I'm going to set my drill bit to drill my hole. I also like the fact that this is pulled forward just a little bit so you're not reaching to the back of the counter. And I'm going to actually draw a whole circle for my drain. Okay. For drill bit wise, I'm going to need a pilot. That'll work. So this is small enough that it'll uh, set my holes because I have to drill actually from above and beneath. And I'll get into this in just a minute. And I'm going to need a couple of serious bits. I'm going to need this bad boy here. And this one here. Now, if you've never seen this before, this hole saw kit absolutely is amazing. It'll save your life. Whenever you have problem solving to do, this is the kind of tool that you want to have around. So these bits all have self-feeding tips on them. And the trick is, I want to drill a hole on top and a hole on bottom that are different thicknesses. And we'll go into the assembly and the reason for it in a minute. Let me just drill my pilot hole right through the wood so that I have this all sorted out. And I'm only dealing with pine, so this is really easy. So here's my sink drain assembly. And this, I'll explain how this functions in a second. This is actually the drain and this part threads in. Okay, so we're going to set this aside for a minute. And here is my washers. Now this cardboard ring is actually quite vital. This is the piece that goes on the bottom. All right, and this is what causes compression for this gasket into the bottom of my stone sink. Okay, the cardboard ring there is actually what transfers that, that pressure into this. And I'll explain this. If I simply had this on here without the cardboard ring, because it's threaded, it's not coming on straight, it's actually on an angle. And so there'll be more pressure on this point than there is on the back, there's a gap. And so when you do that under pressure, it actually causes the gasket to buckle up like this. Okay, and when your gasket buckles under pressure, it leaks. What this cardboard ring does is it, it creates an environment where there's no friction there's just pressure, so you're not binding the rubber when you tighten. So if you throw this out and thinking it's unuse useless packaging, you're making a big mistake and you're going to run yourself in a lot of trouble. So keep that handy. Okay. Now this white foam thing, again, it's not packaging. This is actually the gasket. This compresses almost to nothing. All right. Okay. I only got a little worm. It needs to be mixed up. Okay. So what we're going to use here, yikes, is pipe joint compound. Okay, well this is an old too, but one of those will last you a long time, but the point is this. Teflon tape is more of a lubricant. This is a sealer. So what you do is you always go backwards so you feel it click, and then you roll forward. So you're not cross threading. And you tighten it right in there nice and right and tight. Okay. You can get rid of the excess. There we go. Garbage. Oh, I missed. <laughs> Big surprise, eh? <laughs> so now we have our assembly all put together. We just slide it into the sink. Okay, right to here. And then we want to get the washer, this part facing the sink the flat part facing the washer. Okay, and we're going to try to slide that in position as best we can before we get tightening everything up. 
all right? This is just a giant nut, okay, for attaching this drain. I'm just gonna put my screwdriver in the overflow section, which doesn't matter, okay? This sink doesn't have one. There we go, and I'm just gonna tighten this up until that is nice and tight. I mean, <clears throat> Now, that's as strong as I can do it personally. Now, can I have my wrench, Matt? Okay. There we go. Now, this is really the one chance you're going to get to tighten this on. So, it's not a time to be shy. <laughs> now, since we're dealing with two gaskets, when you've put all your effort into that, then you know you're done. If, if you don't have a lot of upper body strength, you can get a pipe wrench. It's a much longer wrench, so you have much more leverage, okay? This is not the part that's hard. Holding the top is not hard. Putting pressure on that rubber gasket is where you need strength. So you either got some upper body strength or use a longer pair of pliers or a pipe wrench so you can really get a good grip on it, all right? To be honest with you, if your wrench was three inches longer, that almost doubles your strength. It's kind of crazy, but that's the power of leverage. This is done, we'll set this aside, and we'll get ready for, because what we need to do is drill a hole in our countertop that's wide enough for this whole assembly to sit right flush into. It's running at two and a quarter inches wide, which is why I grabbed the drill that's two and a half inches wide. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna drill all the way through this bad boy because it, we don't have any connection here that attaches it to the counter other than gravity and the bottom of the stone. And we're just gonna install it with silicone, believe it or not. So I like to have a little file handy. I actually keep this in my kit with my saws just because when I'm drilling holes, I like to make sure it's nice and sharp. Okay, here we go. We'll put this on regular drill and slow speed because there's a lot of torque here. All right. Now that I'm starting to cut, I'm going to go on reverse just a second. And that makes sure that I'm not causing any splits that are going to tear across my counter. Now we're good to go. And just a little bit of rotation helps make the hole just a hair bigger than the bit and helps keep it from heating up. Woohoo! Okay. Now, instead of busting right through the other side, I know with softwood lumber it's going to split and make a whole mess, so that's why I pre-drilled the hole. I'm going to come from underneath now, finish this hole from down here. This faucet is a little bit different scenario. Okay, we also have to drill the hole for the faucet. Faucet standard hole is one and a quarter, okay, but that's at the top. Here's the other consideration. How thick are the threads? Now, this is a two inch thick countertop. Okay, so when I take two inches off of this, I'm down to the last thread, which means the hole from the bottom side needs to be wide enough for me to attach this underneath, which is my locking mechanism. So, if I want my locking mechanism to be at least attached by a few threads, Okay, then I want to make sure that I drill down from the top all the way through to about an inch and a quarter, and then I'll come the other way to set up my locking thread. So, uh, because I drilled all the way through, I'm going to do the hole underneath first since the bit's already in the drill. And we're just looking to go about a half an inch in. Right about there. 
Now the diameter of the pipe going in the hole is inch and a quarter. That's inch and a quarter. The diameter of the part that's on top is inch and three quarters. And so I'm using a drill bit to make my life easy. That's inch and a half. And we're gonna drill all the way through. Yep. And this one does have a tendency with softwood lumber for these threads to get bunged up, okay? Um, if you wanted to go straight, put the pressure in the middle of the drill behind you, up from here. If you're pushing with your hand, you're always gonna be twisting. So hold it with this one, but push from the top. Full of sawdust here. As a result, the threads aren't pulling anymore. So, just clean that one more time. Now that should be enough to finish this off. Whew. Beautiful. Okay, so let's put this in here, shall we? Now, before I put this in, I pull up my water lines and I'm going to connect them. Uh, important to remember, when you're looking at a faucet, the hot goes on the left, and these lines are marked with red and blue stripes. Okay, they also have a gasket on them, so you only hand tighten here, you don't use a wrench. We can throw this on here for a quarter turn, maybe. Just make sure they're secure. Now, most faucets have a gasket on the front that sits right here on the base of the tower as well, right? So make sure that that's in place. And we run one line and then the other. Okay, that's gonna work out well. Before we put that in place, we wanna drop the stone sink in. This is a situation we're going to use our structural clear silicone. All right, this is a new flex silicone. I love this product. I use it in all my wet areas all the time. These tubes are awesome. Uh, I get these at my commercial supplier because I can change the tips, right? So when it gets full and dried on, you just change the tip out for a new tip and you're back in business. Brilliant. Now, look at the diameter of my sink here, right? That's awesome. I'm going to literally put a bead of silicone right around the hole and make sure that any water that splashes outside of this sink stays on the counter so that I can take care of my maintenance. And then I'm going to go like this just to help secure it in place. All right, here goes everything. Yeah. Here we go. So now we have to put our assembly locking set on. All right. The idea is to get all that over the base of the sink. Yeah, that's going to work good. And then our locking ring. Incredibly important, especially in this situation where you're burrowing your own hole. That hole is not going to be perfectly flat. We're going to just set this on, get it up and over. Going to go backwards until we feel it click. There it goes. Now we're going to tighten it up. Now, this is the point where we have to make sure the faucet is pointing directly in line with the drain. Okay, now I'm going to hold it still while I turn these clamps. Now, I don't have to over tighten here because we actually use the screwdriver to tighten the clamp. Okay, on both sides. Brilliant. Okay. So here we go. Just gonna use the sponge to get off some of this residual paint. And 
drywall compound, it seems thick. <laughs> Not uncommon. Next in the program, we are going to install nice decorative caps. All right, and a couple of shark bite shutoffs. Now, now, little tip here, just use your wrench to secure your pipe while you're pushing on your shark pipe valve. Okay. There we go. Okay, now here's a great little gadget. This is on the hinge, and it actually fits around ABS pipe. It's not perfect but it's not bad for creating a decorative cap around a drain pipe. It'll work in a pinch to close up those ugly holes on an exposed area. <laughs> so the next process is to assemble the drain. It's a piece of cake, really. What we're gonna do is we're just gonna establish our height. Now this piece of pipe that's coming out of this wall, it's not glued in, okay? It's just there to trap any potential sewer gases mid-construction. And what you wanna do is make sure that when you're measuring, you have just a minor slope. One degree level is fine. Hold this here and let's get our, our dimension from the countertop to the bottom here. And that represents the total rise that we have to have in our plumbing. Okay, so that's nine and a half inches. This is the fitting. It goes one and a half pipe to one and a quarter interior here. That's almost every vanity drain in the world is one and a quarter. Kitchen sink drains are one and a half. So when you're buying this fitting, make sure you're buying the one and a half by one and a quarter because the kitchen pieces are one and a half by one and a half. And that'll cause you problems. So for bathrooms, one and a half by one and a quarter. And I can be as high as that or as low as that. So I've got a little bit of movement here, right? So just to make sure that I've got flexibility, I'm going to start in the middle. And what did I say? Nine and a half here? Yeah. So that pipe is going to come across. I'm going to put a 90 on it and then a 90 this way. Okay. Boom. Right to here. And I'm going to have it set to nine and a half. So nine and a half is my total pipe. Right. Minus to this ridge. So my taking my, my, let me simplify this a little bit. I'm taking the total rise that I need, which is basically nine and a half inches, okay? I'm coming over here and I'm gonna from measure from this ridge right here, because the pipe inserts inside. Minus two and a half, gives me seven inch pipe. So we're gonna cut that and get this installed. So my plan here is to install this pipe, okay? On my drain, run my pipe to the back and then over. And you'll see, that'll work out fine, okay? But I want to run the pipe right to the back wall and then over, so it's away from the water supply lines. After I have this installed, I'm not sure what I'm going to do for the front of this. I might end up putting a piece of 1x12 pine and make a little box just to encapsulate all this so that it's all hidden. We're going to wait and see what I decide later. Just a word of caution. When you're working with your ABS glue, it's a solvent base over vinyl flooring. They don't get along. <laughs> so do be careful. Now let's take this whole assembly and get this put together. Now, this P-trap comes with a clean out. It's an emergency access hatch here. This is great for if you're washing your hands and you lose your ring. Right. It should get stuck in the P-trap, and then you can just open this up over a pail and be able to rescue your ring. This is why we use them in these kind of areas. Because we have access, we might as well maintain access. Just wrap a little Teflon tape around those threads. Just three times as plenty. And that helps make sure they have a perfect seal. Okay. Now these are all plastic fittings. So when you're using a wrench, just give a little tuck. If you over tighten it, you'll end up causing things to twist and go out of shape like, like an oval and you'll end up causing a leak. So be careful of that. Okay. 
There we go. Same thing with the other color. Get a few nice runs on there because it'll act as a lubricant and a sealant. And we're going straight back. Okay, here we go. Now, we're going to put a little bit of glue on the fitting and on the pipe. So what we're doing is we're actually melting both pieces of this ABS and then we're sticking it together. All right, that's how you do that properly. You don't need a whole lot to make this work. Just enough to make it look like it got wet. Okay. Now we got all that pushed together. We'll slide that over top and then tighten this ring. <clears throat> Remember, that piece of pipe you're attaching this to was also put in clockwise. So when you're done tightening it on, turn your fitting clockwise into position. Make sure that it's not coming loose. Very good. Now, I sent my son to the store. When he gets back, he's gonna have a couple of other elbows for me. We'll connect the rest of that pipe real quick and then it'll be finished. So here's our mirror. And this is our lovely little mirror pad with a heating cable. This is a peel and stick scenario. <laughs> I wish it was gonna be easier to get started, but here we go really want to get this lined up relatively in the middle and then we can just peel off the rest of that the best part about this system is it's peel and stick and now our wiring is hooked up to our light so it's guaranteed to be fog free we're going to put the link in the description for how you can contact these products they are amazing and all we have to do is just open up these little rings here and fill it around for a minute or two until we find the mounting locations. Hey, and that side. All right. So there's only one other thing I want to try to do. And this might seem crazy, but when you have a mirror that's this huge, just hanging on two screws, it's awfully wobbly. So what I'm going to suggest is you take some two-sided tape and you put it on the back of the mirror. <laughs> and then you peel that extra side off. And we're going to actually use a little adhesive and attach it to the stone. Okay. Here we go. So what you need to remember is that because we're on these two screws, if you just pull the top away from the wall just a little bit, then it's going to change the height of the mirror. See that? Pull the top away, then you let the bottom in, press that tape into the wall. Okay? Now it's not carrying all the weight, but it's going to just hold it in position so that now those screws are going to carry the weight and it won't be wobbly. Okay, the only thing left now to do is to connect the water supply lines. Now listen, most of these braided faucets have a gasket inside there, so you don't have to over tighten with a wrench. Just finger tighten. Put the blue supply line on the right side as soon as you can find out where it goes. Hello. Oh, that's what it is. Typical. I made a rookie mistake. I bought the Sharp Bikes. I made sure that I had the right look, but I didn't check the package. <laughs> Whenever you're at the hardware store, realize people look at something and then they put it back. They never put it in the right spot. So what I was trying to connect to was a quarter inch supply line, which is only for fridges. I needed a three eighths. <laughs> so I just stole the one from the toilet. We'll finish this now. I gotta go back to the store now to buy something for the toilet supply line, which I'm doing tomorrow. Now we can go back and connect this. Aye, 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 aye. Always, 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 always double check. I can't believe I did that. It's been a while since I didn't get the right fixture, but 
It happens. Okay, there we go. Now we'll put the hot one on. All right. And we'll get the wrench on here a couple of turns just to make sure we embed that gasket in the line. Okay. Now for the drain stopper, this threads into the bottom of the drain and it's a clicker. Okay, has this little flange gasket here. So you just set it over top. Again, go, go counterclockwise until you feel it sitting in there. Right, that's the spot. And then thread it in. Okay, and then we have a drain. <laughs> the danger of this in this type of bowl is because there's no overflow. <laughs> if you do this and fill it, don't leave the room. Well, the world of toilets hasn't really changed a lot in the last, I don't know, 70 years, except for the body design style. So when you're looking for your toilet, you want to have to take a look at a couple of options that really separate the men from the boys in this business. One of them is, is it dual flush? Great water conservation there. The other issue is, does it have the ability to actually move a lot of content through the pipe? And the toilets come with a rating on it for that. So you want to check that as well. And the other thing, of course, and this is my favorite, soft closed toilet seat. <laughs> I mean, it's such a simple investment, right? Just a few dollars and you can have the seat. You can slam it, but it never makes any noise. It just, oh, it's beautiful. I love my soft closed seat. Anyway, we're gonna install it today. We're doing it over top of our, our vinyl floor that's floating on top of our heating system. So what we have here is we have this little build out set. It comes with a, a foam gasket with the bolts already in place and then it comes with this Teflon ring, okay? And it sits right there like that. And then over top of that, you place this huge foam gasket. Now the reason I'm using this instead of wax is because this house is really old and it has a lot of movement through the different seasons. So if I have any movement in this floor over time, I need to have a gasket that's under compression that during movement will grow back in its position. Okay, this goes compressed and it'll grow back. So if the toilet ends up moving a little bit over four seasons, it's not gonna be a concern. This will self seal all year round. Wax, once it gets compressed, it stays compressed. And if the toilet moves, now you've got a gap so the water will get out. So this is the perfect kind of flange cover to use if you have an old house like we do, and we're gonna have a lot of movement. So. Without further ado, let's bring the toilet in here, show you a couple of simple tips and tricks for getting these installed. So just so you understand, when you're dealing with a one-piece toilet with this slimline design, you are gonna have to have a tool that reaches in, sits on top of the bolts, and then you can tighten. So, you know, here's another great example. I've got my crescent wrench with the detachable bits. This is an amazing tool, comes in so handy. We're gonna use that for installation today. I also like the fact that the back of it is scooped out so I've got room for my water supply line and we got room to get in and behind it. Uh, let's get this spun around, Matt, real quick. So one of the major benefits of a one-piece toilet is the fact that you don't have an extra contact between a tank and the bowl. Usually those areas are like a really common place where you get dripping and water leaks. So you don't have to take that extra risk and it makes it really easy to clean and you don't have a lot of place where surface dust can collect and that sort of thing. So what we're gonna do because we're using the rubber gasket instead of the wax, we can actually just tilt it, slide it back, and set it in place. With wax, you have to set it down nice and flush. All right. And at this point, the toilet should be sitting above the floor. That's perfect. Because what you want to know is you need compression. If this is touching the floor and it's sitting there and it's not moving, there's no compression. You need to build up your ring a little bit more. But this is perfect the way it is. So the idea of install is the same as a regular toilet. You have to get this little brass plate up and over <laughs> onto there. And then you've got to reach in, get the nut on from behind the toilet, and just tighten it down till it's loose. All right. And then we're going to slide this over top of the bowl. This is going to take a minute. Now, 
You hear that? Oh, without a ratchet wrench right here, you're in a lot of trouble, right? So we're pretty solid here, but we're gonna do your side with that as well. So you can, you can see here that this side is a lot lower. And yeah, so this is the thing. Don't tighten it up to the point where you can't move it anymore. Just get it set so that the ratchet is working. Get to the other side. And now we'll just tighten that side until the toilet's level. So I've been sitting here with this ratchet for almost two minutes tightening this down. There's so much limitation in the movement. But the reality is, is everyone who's installed one of these one-piece toilets without a ratchet system, you just can't get enough, you can't get enough strength on that to make it work. Once you have it level, it's time to install the seat. The toilet seat, let's talk that for a second. This is not a standard seat. You can't just go to the store and buy one. This is not a basic elongated or round. This is specific to the bowl design here. So make sure when you buy your toilet, if you want soft clothes, you buy it as part of the package or you're gonna be really frustrated because you won't be able to just go to the store and buy one after. The installation system here, it's very standard for a soft close. You just have to back off these screws here a little bit. And you set the toilet on and everything moves around. Here it is. Okay, and it all clips into place. And you can see there's lots of movement here. So what you wanna do is get that down and then maneuver your seat so that you have it where you want it. Once you find your happy place, you lift it back up, push your two pins in here. Now tighten these back up again. Okay. This particular manufacturer has a decorative cover because it's somewhat visible when the seat is on. You give these stainless steel discs for covering this up. Okay, so now you can install that. And that's as good as done on the toilet seat, both at the same time. Okay. That's it? Yep, and watch how the soft clothes works. <laughs> that's awesome. So that's how you don't wake anybody else in the house up in the middle of the night. <laughs> okay, now the sides are really interesting. They've got this really nice snap-on cover. It goes over the side to close up the access point. <sighs> it's a little tricky. You see these rings? These are designed, these four corners, they clip onto the groove edges here. And then this actually snaps onto that piece. There's a whole lot going on here, but the idea is you reach in behind Again. Seems like it takes an awful lot of work, but they haven't invented a better snap on system yet. And then you just take on your cap, set that in position, and there you go. Trap door for the toilet. There you go. You really got to use that fingertip and just, it's maddening. He's got to do it, eh? Get her done. Are you on nice and snug? Good stuff. Okay, Matt, next thing is the water supply line. Now, I love buying braided water supply lines, okay? They, right. they come with a gasket already inside there, so there's no additional assembly required. You simply reach in behind the toilet, thread that on, and what you want to do is you want to go backwards so you feel it click, and then tighten it on. It's a plastic thread on a plastic fitting. So you can cross-thread that real easily if you're not careful, all right? So you just reach back there, close your eyes, you can't see with your fingers. So. You can't oh, see. Oh. You feel it? There was no click, but I feel you it. Felt the, you felt yeah. it grab? Okay. Kind of. Thing. And then you just finger tighten it. It didn't grab. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if it's easier from this side. It is, because you're right. I'm right-handed. Back and forth on the round thing, yeah. <laughs> I'm listening for the click. Yeah. Matt, what? it should be going this way. You told me this way. No, that's what you said. <laughs> Freaking garage. Well, I'm, just, I'm just letting you have a little room for personal expression. No, the information's good. You just didn't want to hear. How's, it, how's that working? This is turning it's into the long. longest video. Okay, tell you what. Just give it to me for a second, because I'm right-handed and I can reach in from the right hand.
It wasn't working because they put on a fitting from the factory. The thread that you want is what's there now, but with that there, there wasn't tightening on that. So I was going the right way. You were probably doing everything right, and at the same time, mm. having a little bit of experience pays. When I felt that other fitting, I'm like, that's odd. Usually it's just a plastic stem. There you go. Now, whatever kind of pressure you can get from two fingers is gonna be good. You're not gonna leak for that gasket. Now you just connect it to the supply line. And once you've got it finger tight, you can give it another quarter turn with that bad boy. <laughs> well, that's unique. You know, that click isn't a bad trick. No, you it's never a, taught me that. Well, I just did. That would have been great for all those times where you're like, oh, you crossed that today. If I teach you all my tricks up front, though, then you don't learn anything the hard way. You don't respect them. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out where in the world would they ever need that fitting? So what part of the world do you think they have a different water supply line size? Europe. Maybe, eh? Just because the plugs are different. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. The other thing is that we wouldn't really know because the instructions that came in this toilet were in Chinese characters. Chinese, yeah. There were like literally three pictures. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons we're making this video, we almost didn't make a toilet video, but then we saw the instructions and went, wow, <laughs> we better walk through this together just in case. And I'm glad we did because we probably would have spent half a day back there trying to attach that water supply line. Here we are. Oh. Now the only other system that has to be installed is the dual flush, right? Now the tank is an obvious contour, so that makes it really easy. That's awesome. Is that on? Yeah, that's it. That's the install. So in this video, I'm going to show you how to install an awesome bathroom appliance called the electric heated towel rack. These bad boys look beautiful and function amazing. So they warm your towels when you're coming out of the bathroom. Now, when it comes to installing one of these, there's really only a couple things you need to know. A, you got to give power to it. I prefer to run a line right from my light switch or my fan switch, depending on which has more room, and bring it right over to this box. Now, when it comes to location of your box, I find the easiest way to do it is figure out where on your wall you want this before you put your drywall up. And then make sure there's a stud on the one side, but on the power side, you want to make sure that you measure over to the center of your box, mount it on a bracing in between the studs, and it's good to go. Now, if you want to see that happen in depth, we have that information in our how to do electrical video for a bathroom. We'll put the link in the description below. Basically, you're bringing power from your supply line, which is at your light switch, Bring it over to this location. There's no on or off switch with this product. It just works with the switch. So if you put it on live power when you walk in the room with your lights or your fan, you're good to go. Now for ease of application, this product comes with a ton of extra wire. And if you want, you can try to hook it up sitting on the floor. And then you can try to stick all of this wire in the box. Or you can do what I do. Just set the garbage can in the room myself a little bit of slack and then cut the extra out of the way. And there we go. Problem solved. Now that box has got lots of room. Now this little tool that I have here is also a wire stripper. So I'm just going to find the right gauge for the wire and strip the sheathing off. <laughs> and then it's all prepped and ready to roll. The only other thing we got to do, and I can do this right here right now because I have not powered up the circuit. I ran a new circuit for this bathroom, so I know I'm good to go. If you're not sure if you're going to zap yourself, you can grab one of these bad boys. Turn the light on, make sure it's green. If there's live power there, it'll blink and go red. That'll be like, don't touch this, go turn off the breaker first. And then once that's good, we're in business. La da da. Now, before we can make our connections, we have to establish the location for all of the mounts. Now, on the back of this, you'll see every one of these legs here has a mounting pin that goes into the wall and a set screw to tighten it on. So it's important to get all these locations just perfect. So the process for that is not outlined in the paperwork that comes with the product, oddly enough. Now, in the box with the product comes this beautiful decorative plate. These screws on this plate are lined up with the mounting locations on the box. Okay. 
and that is going to be our, our primary location. We're going to go install the rest of this based off of that. In this kit comes three little caps. They kind of resemble a flared thimble. All right, and it passes into that hole. Lots of room to go maneuver, but then the set screw is what tightens it all up. So there's a little bit of mercy involved here, and this one also has a thimble on it as well. Same thing. All right, and they get attached with the wood screws that come in there in the wall. So what we're going to do is we're going to just shove all of the wire in through the hole so that we can temporarily mount the unit on this one location. Then we're going to take out a torpedo level and put everything where it belongs. Okay, here we go. Now, even though this is magnetic, because it's chrome, it's not going to stick to it. So you have to be somewhat careful here. Oh. <laughs> I always prefer to trust my level and not my eyesight. There we go. That's my spot. Whew. Now you'll notice if you watch the video where we ran the wire, I know there's a stud right behind these two because I based this location off of that stud. But what I don't know is where I should put that thimble. And so we're going to just use our pencil here and we're going to make a few marks around the base location where they contact the wall. And I'm going to guarantee you that if you finish your paint job before you do this, you're going to need to do some touch-ups. So don't be disappointed. It's going to happen no matter what you do. All right. All right. Now let me get all this out of the way. And then we can mount all of our, all of our brackets. You love Phillips, eh? I hate Phillips. I like I hate it so much. And that's why. Okay, we're gonna take our thimble now. We're gonna reverse it, put the fat side against the wall, center it on your pencil marks. Take your screw, pass it straight in, puncture that drywall. Wow, that was a lousy shot, eh? Even I know that wasn't the middle. Okay. It's just a matter of screwing these on and we're good to go. Love them Phillips screws. Last one. Oh, this is where good planning works out, right? Beautiful. That's going to work amazing. Now, there's still two things that we have to do. Oh, ho! Now, for mounting, of course, they give you the most delicate of set screws. Here we go. So, we're going to back these out just a little bit. And don't worry if you lose one. Standard practice now is for these companies to put extra ones in the package. But before you start, make sure you empty out the package hardware, get it on a counter somewhere, take your inventory. Here we go. Now, then we got a location set. We have to run our wire through our plate. So we have one solid wire and one of these little fiber wires. We're going to just thread it, twist it around there a few times. Okay, and we're going to use our little blue moret cap. Twist it on nice and tight so that it can't jiggle loose over time. We'll do that with all three of these. We'll connect white to white, black to black. Ground to ground. Now ground has got this green and yellow on it. You can't miss it. No sense having extra wire on there. When you're done, you shouldn't see any exposed wire beneath the moret cap. That's just one way that you can be confident to know that when you tuck this into the box, it's not going to make contact with any other exposed wire in there, like the ground wire. Right? You don't want anything else to be in touch with that ground wire. Fold everything over, push them as deep as the box as you can. Make sure you have room. Pre-twisting your wires is a genius way to make sure that they're going to get good connection. It gives you the ability to twist it and then pinch beneath there so that nothing's moving around while you turn this on. All right, let's just get this one in here now. Okay. It's going to be a lot easier. Put this on 
and then feed the wire in and just try to attach it to the bar and then try to stick it on. Simply because these screws are not going to be accessible once that bar is hanging there. Okay, always good to make sure your screws are on with your hands first. Get a couple of turns so you know they're not threaded. The drills are powerful enough to drive them in there and re-thread it and strip it off. Okay, here we go. Now just like we did when we just set it up to begin with, we are going to feed all this wire inside that box. Oh, it's getting a little stiff. It's a good thing we put cut off almost half of it before we start. Okay. Now, here we go. That's all finished. The only thing left to do is to tighten up these little set screws. So we'll start up here. Okay. Before I put any more on, I want to double check my level and put pressure down. Well, because when I tighten that set screw, it drives, drives it down. And that is still perfect. So all I have to do now is keep, keep a little bit of pressure applied on this while I'm tightening these up. Make sure they're tightening up as close to the wall as possible. This is all about patience. Sometimes this little fiddling around will drive a person crazy. But <laughs> if you're patient, you won't cause too much damage to the wall you're working on. If you try to do it this way, the bottom of this almost always scratches out the wall. Okay. Now we have it attached to the wall basically, but we still want to attach the power to the switch. So stay with us for that, and we'll show you how to wire the switch up as well. If you like this kind of content, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to hit your notification bell so you see every time we put up a video, you get notified be able to see that. In this package, they came with these cheesy little plastic plugs. And to be honest with you, if you're trying to fish a wire up to a place in a wall and you want to mount a box, you're going to cause damage to your wall to get that done. If you're not going to be on wood and you want to try to install this with plastic, I'm going to suggest don't. Take the time, cut the hole in the drywall, get some blocking in the wall, and don't ever use these. Because you know what happens. Someone put a towel on here, they'll lean out of the shower, grab the towel, and give it a yank, and the whole damn thing is going to come flying off the wall. If you don't install it in wood, just don't install it. So what I've got here is I've got you know, this black and white that goes to the light fixture. Pretty much every light fixture you're going to ever replace in your house is going to have a black and a white. And if it's old, it may have been bent around a lot, right? Oh, and they, t they break off real easy. Okay, so if you're doing a new light fixture, sometimes it's better just cut the old ends off. Flip over to your strippers. Uh, let's be honest, strippers are a part of every electrician's life. There we go. Now, in this situation, our mounting box is way back on the wood like it should be and we have drywall and we have a nice thick porcelain tile so you will find that the mounting screws for your new fixture won't be long enough okay this bracket you want to have it sitting nice and proud out here okay because these screws here are actually coinciding with the plate and then these little nuts here actually hold the fixture to the wall. So, uh, knowing this, I'm going to show you a little trick that I learned from an electrician friend of mine. And that is for mounting this to the, to the uh, area to keep this brass flush with that tile. Okay, which is key to a good installation. First thing we do is we take our little tool here and we're going to grab the end of the ground plier, wire and we're going to create a little hook on it, okay? We're going to use that wire to hook the ground screw on our finished trim. All right, now we want to be careful here because that's my design, that's my finish, that's a good location. Okay, so I'm going to bring it from the other way. Pinch that back together again. Okay, and then tighten the screw up. Okay, now, whew. 
The other thing we want to do is we want to rescue these little end nuts. from off of this here. Set them aside for later. One measurement you need is from the wall, which would be tight to this in the perfect scenario, out to the surface of the face. And that's coming out at three quarters of an inch. When you tighten this up, it's three quarters of an inch from the back of the stone to the face of this nut. That's the measurement we're working with. So, I want to install this onto that bracket I'm a, if, I, if I install the back plate flush with the stone, I have three quarters of an inch for my little nut to go on there. Let me just get a measurement. That takes me to an inch and a quarter. Okay. Now those little nuts are not that long. So your best plan here is to recess this mounting screw. Oh, come on. It should be so much easier. All right. Twist this back and then twist in the, the threaded rod so that you're only at one inch. One inch from the back plate. And that is an inch and an eighth. And I'm gonna go just a little bit more. And if we can't go any more than that, then what we know to do is recess this plate in the hole if possible. But it's just good to know how this works because not every situation is gonna be desirable to recess the plate in the hole, a lot of times you're going to want to opt for recessing the threaded rod that comes on here. Let me double check. One inch there, one inch there. Perfect. Okay, so here we go. Now, I have some hardware here that I brought that'll solve all my problems with mounting this light fixture in a recessed box. And that is I went out and bought some screws. Now, what you want to do is go to the local hardware store, pick up a box of machine screws. And this is just a basic machine thread. It's a 632 by inch and a half. This is what you want to grab. I hate Phillips. Now, you can put this screw into the box and set the depth right where we want it, okay? But there's nothing to keep it from falling in. This is the million dollar problem that everybody has when they're doing electrical work. So we have measured from the tile to the face of the fixture to mount it. But when I'm mounting, if this is falling in on me, then I'm in a whole lot of trouble, okay? So here's what we do. Take this off. You take your moret. This is the tip of the day, right? You put it right on to where that mounting box is and you take a look at your depth and it's just a hair like it's just an eighth of an inch take your side cutters and grab a hold of that bad boy it's not showing very well but there is a hole and that is what you're looking for and this becomes your washer so in two is you want to take your drill bit to get rid of that metal thread part that's inside. Okay, set it on top. Use it like a nail punch. There it is. And this is the thing that's in your way. This is great for tying your wires together, but really inconvenient when you're setting this up. <laughs> Come on, baby. Boy, you can get it in, but you can't get it out, eh? I'm just having a lot of fun with this, aren't I? <laughs> I've never seen this be so stupid. <clears throat> Holy Hannah. Now it's just about rescuing my damn drill bit. Okay. So there's my screw. And here is my extension. We're going to hold this moret. And here's the advantage to making sure the power's off. There's a lot going on here, so don't try this live. <laughs> there we go. And there's just enough of that screw 
The other option is you can go out and buy 40 or 50 of these silly little washers and stack them all up. Having one of these morettes handy is a lot easier. And versatile. Now we're ready to mount our box. Okay. Okay. Now, now that box is completely secured, which is awesome. The only other thing you have to do now is you have to mount this level. Well, that just barely gets in here, doesn't it? <laughs> Now, I need to use my torpedo level here because this will tell me what level looks like. And I don't want to trust your eyes standing on a ladder. Come on, baby. All right, now there's a set screw on the panel here. Once you've got a level, you tighten that bad boy up till you hear some resistance. <laughs> now your whole fixture will sit level if it's been manufactured square to the plate, which in a lot of cases it isn't, but this fixture seems to be of a higher quality. I shouldn't have that issue. Hmm, not a big surprise. I would love to buy everything made in North America. Any of these threaded wire, they always have too little of the exposed wire left for my liking. Now you might be one of these guys who's like, no, I love it when there's just a little bit. But I can't stand it. I like to pre-wrap my wire just so that I can sleep easy. I hate doing things twice. Okay, so before we get started, let's release all of these here. Now the idea behind these little clips, if you haven't seen them before, is these are designed to hold the glass shade on. All right, and what you have to do is put the shades on before you put on the light bulbs. And we're installing our fixture this way. So it's really easy to do after it's installed. But I figure I'd just save myself a step because I'll be working over my head at that point. Now, well, there's a good question for you. Maybe you can fill that out in the comments section. Do you like the light fixtures when the lights are pointing down or when they're pointing up? You know, that's, it's an option. Especially today when you're going with LED. I know some people you know, not the majority in my experience, but some people love it, light shining up, so it's not direct light in their face. But I've always been a proponent of having light in your face for those moments when you need to see what the heck is going on with your face. Okay, now, what we're gonna do is take our ground wire. I also call it the hanging wire because I put it on that green screw, put two loops on that bad boy, okay? And then I have an ability to hang my fixture. All right. And if I could just learn how to use a screwdriver, we'll be all right. We're gonna tighten that up again. There we go. Nice and gentle here. <laughs> yeah, nice and gentle, eh? That's funny. All right. Now we're gonna connect our wires. We'll start with the black. Oh, I should have probably hung that wire a little closer together. Give it a little twist. Hold the wires at the base. Thread on the blue. Okay. And do the same with the white one. Okay. Now, if you can, push the MRAC connections back inside the box, that is ideal, all right? These connections here are not in the way if you leave them where the plate is, but if you can get them back inside the box, then do that, all right? Now all we have to do is get these two screws Stick through that plate and it should be perfect because we measured. This is not the time where you want to identify how deep the screws should be and make your adjustments. Now that everything's already attached and screwed in there, it's very difficult to fool around with it. That's why I like to measure in advance and put on these little balls 
Now the same thing, go backwards until you feel it click. There it is. Oh. Keep a screwdriver handy. There's always going to be a wire that's going to be a little bit of a frustration. Okay. Make sure that you're not compressing the wires against the plate to the stone or the back wall. And off you go. All right. Beautiful. Okay. Now this is my lens. It comes with a sticker on it. Make sure you remove the sticker. This will get dried on or heated up if you're using an incandescent bulb and it'll be almost impossible to manage. You set that over top. You thread that piece on like this, going backwards until it sits in properly. And then you can go forward. Okay? If you go, it's a very aggressive thread. If you just start turning it on and try to force it in, you're going to hurt yourself. The little sticker that was on the shade mentioned that uh, this fixture has maximum 100 watt light bulbs. And I'm like, well, that's nice, but I'm not putting 400 watts of power in front of my face. We're going to use these 60 watt LEDs. Because it's nicer to have a white light than it is to have a yellow light. Especially when using LED lights in the pot lights in the room. Nice to have the same color temperature in the bulbs all throughout your space. That's just one of those little signs that says you thought about what you were doing before you got started, right? You've seen it all before in someone's house. You'll go in and the standard little will have a bunch of yellow lights and a bunch of white lights. <laughs> Has everybody's too cheap to throw something in the garbage that's still working, even though it looks horrible. <laughs> Here we go. These fixtures still have the ability to balance out, even post-install, all right? So make sure that it looks pretty. There we go, all done. Thanks for joining us for that demonstration on how to renovate your own bathroom. But here's the good part. Let's talk about the money because there's quite a few elements in here that may or may not have been in the video. Like for instance, we have this awesome clear mirror in the shower behind us. It's got an LED light and a, and a you know, like heated mirror so that it doesn't fog up. So you can shave in the shower. Great for men, right? We also have the towel warmer. We also did all of our own electrical on permit. Now I know some of you guys out there, you know, you're different places in the world. Your electrical is different. So like down in the States, you guys are all 20 amp, but we're 15. So don't be too hard on me if you watch the electrical video on how to do all your own wiring in your bathroom. We'll put the link up here for you, okay? Now the last thing we want to talk about was the numbers, right? So the cost of the vanity and the sink and the herringbone, the mirror, the lights, the towel warmer, the door, the tile, the shower pan, all of this stuff, the flooring, the heated floor system. I mean, there's a lot of materials, right? But it's under $5,000, that's Canadian money. So if you're from the States, you're probably looking at about a $4,000 investment. Now here's the good news. When you do a project like this, and you take your old boring builder outdated bathroom, and you renovate $4,000 of material with all your own time, sweat, and love, and blood, you get a huge return. Because the value of this house goes up about ten dollars to $15,000 getting this bathroom done. Now that is money in the bank, right? So <laughs> listen, if you enjoy this kind of content, and you're looking for information about how to renovate because you're like me and you know it's necessary to get ahead nowadays, then click the subscribe button below. And then don't forget to hit the notification bell so that you get notified from YouTube every time we put out a new video, which should be pretty much every Saturday night at 9, Eastern Standard Time. And one more thing, if you're a renovator and you need help, may I encourage you to join our membership program. I guarantee to answer questions for our members. YouTube has changed our little computer studio so I can see every one of your questions and make sure that I answer them and they don't let me get away with it. So that's awesome. We also have an email so you can send us pictures and ask details and do some counseling for you. We're here to help. We want to help see everybody out there be successful in your renovation because we're not just showing you tips and tricks so that you can mess up your house. We're showing you how to make it better. <laughs> Thanks a lot for joining us today. Don't forget to hit the like button if you think you might have learned something valuable. And if you want to see the entire playlist of this project, it's right here. We've got all the videos broken down into sections. So if you miss something, you can scroll through that playlist and find what it is that you're looking for. We'll see you again the next time.